broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. It's a Tuesday morning. We are coming to you as always from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios. I'm Prashant with me, my colleague Sonia and Nigel. Guys, hi, morning. Hi, good morning, Prashant. Good morning, good morning, Nigel. Well, it doesn't feel like a Tuesday morning because you have a holiday tomorrow. But midweek holidays, right? So always cheerful. But not so cheerful for the market considering the kind of sell off that we've seen lately. Well, that's right. Overnight queues as well, not too supportive. And we got a bit of a challenge ahead of us. Well, let's hope that there is some kind of recovery mm -hmm. from the low point of the day, Prashant. Absolutely. And I think it's all geopolitics more than anything else. And we, you know, yesterday morning we were kind of thinking that, well, we've seen the end of it. That, uh, you know, you had uh, one side sort of which attacked, the other side responded over the weekend and then they said, well, this is it, we're not going to do anything more unless the other side retaliates. So markets were calm, even though we, yesterday we did sell off in response to the overall reaction. But this morning there is further fresh chances of escalation. So let me just tell you uh, where things stand. It's geopolitics and data which are largely leading uh, the, or rather driving markets right now and driving markets to the downside. So uh, equities in the U.S. slipped again. You have the S&P, which is down about one and a quarter percent. The Nasdaq is down 1.7, 1 1.8%. And this is the comment from the geopolitical side, which more than anything else has really hurt sentiment. Uh, and it kind of has put markets on the edge, tentative, weight mode, uh, whatever you want to call it. The Israeli defense minister has to basically told the U.S. Pentagon, uh, which is the Department of Defense, that uh, they've got no choice but to retaliate against Iran. And this is what markets did not want, right? Uh, markets were kind of attributing very low possibility that both sides uh, are going to go and de-escalate because uh, uh, of a variety of things. But I think this is kind of puts uh, everyone uh, everyone on, on the watch out once again in terms of what will happen. Iran, for example, is again making comments that uh, if, his, if we see an it, uh, attack uh, or a ret retaliation from uh, Israel, uh, we're going to sort of uh, uh, respond in a very severe kind of a way. So it raises the prospects of a conflict in the wider conflict in the region, one we've not seen for decades. I mean, between Israel and Iran, we've not had, uh, you know, something like this uh, for a long, long 30, 40 years now. Uh, you, the other one was, of course, data. So U.S. retail sales continue to be strong, uh, and so, which basically shows you that the consumer in the U.S. is, is, is doing just fine, is healthy. Uh, and that, talk, uh, that, that ties in with what markets have been talking about, which is, sort of delaying the first rate cut from the Fed because, the, you know, the economy is doing just fine and the quantum also being lower. So later and lesser in terms of rate cuts is what uh, many are talking about. Actually, many sell-side economists are now saying that, well, perhaps no rate cuts at all in 2024. The uh, Technically as well, and I highlighted this over the last two days, the S&P E-mini, the S&P Futures, which is the most liquid contract, uh, that is that closed below the 55-day moving average for the first time since November. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll watch for a weekly close. And if you get a weekly close below the 55-day moving average, you're basically looking at a test of the 200-day. That will be about an 8%, 8.5% fall from where we are right now. So the U.S. as well, for the first time, we've not had a fall or correction at all. It looks like. Uh, a little tentative. Now, the U.S. 10-year, that jumped about 8 basis points. We're at 4.6. The dollar index uh, sort of rose once again, 106.15. Uh, you, uh, you had oil prices, which held steady at about uh, 90 and a half. Gold prices were up. These are all sort of risk hedges, 23.80 as far as gold is concerned. Where do we go from here? Uh, and, you know, we were saying this yesterday as well. You'll get the time to get in, but uh, the situation is kind of fluid right now, so no harm in waiting. So we, yesterday's, as of yesterday's close, the 20 days at 22,283, uh, uh, we closed just about 10 points under that particular level. So, I mean, of course, you'll get a lower start this morning. So on the way down, supports come in at 22,200, roughly, 22,204 to be precise, which is the 40-day exponential. And the 61.8% retracement of the rise, the full recent rise, is 22,117. So most likely, I mean, if this impulsive rise is over, you're looking at a test of about uh, 22,100 uh, or so. For the bank nifty, supports come in at the 20-day moving average, which is 47,432. Uh, and then the 40, which is 47,300. A similar kind of retracement, 61.8% retracement of the rise from 45,828 to 49,057 is 47,062. So are we kind of looking at 
uh, that 61 point, I mean, I would actually more than uh, the 40 day, I'd look at the 61.8, both the Nifty and the Bank Nifty. For the Nifty, that number would be about 20, uh, 22,120. For the Bank Nifty, it's at about 47,100. Not very far, uh, basically, by the way, another, another one and a half, two percent or so, and you're there. And then we will decide what to do. The gift nifty will come up on your screen, indicating about a 190 odd point lower start. Sonia. Oh, absolutely. And it's it's uh, what the second day that we're seeing, you know, yeah. some amount of pressure, right? Not looking good at all in trade uh, this morning. U.S. markets continue to be under pressure. So even if you look at, you know, the last couple of days, actually, it's been the sixth straight session that the U.S. markets, the Dow, has been uh, in the red. So there's definitely some caution in the system. You can call it because of the geopolitical reasons, because of the way gold has been surging. Uh, you know, crude prices have been higher. Asian markets continue to decline. So there's a big, a steep fall in most Asian markets this morning as well uh, on geopolitical concerns. Brent crude prices continue to be above $90 a barrel. Gold prices are firm. The 10-year Treasury yield is now at 4.61, which is uh, the highest that we've seen since the month of November last year. And the CBOE Volatility Index, which is the CBOE VIX, you know, which is the fear gauge, as we call it, has hit a six-year high. So things are definitely not looking good in the system. But what do you do at a time like this? Remember, the Nifty is already down about 500 points from the 10th April high. We hit a high of somewhere around 22,750. The market has already lost about 500 points from there. So there is definitely some risk aversion that this market is seeing at the moment. Will it extend itself? Perhaps it could. Um, there are a lot of individual stocks to watch out for as well uh, in terms of result reactions. Tomorrow, of course, is a holiday. But on Thursday, you have um, Infosys, Bajaj Auto, HDFC Life that will be reporting their numbers. Uh, so keep an eye out on that. And for our own markets as well, you know, both IT and banks, there could be some sell-off considering that, you know, overall the market texture is on the weaker side. So maybe some safe haven buying in uh, in pharma names, etc. Consumer stocks too. Keep an eye out on those pockets. But otherwise, looks like it's going to be a very, very tricky start to trade today. Well, that's right, Sonia. It's going to be a tricky start to trade. And, you know, the last couple of sessions haven't been good. So I think from the low point of the day, maybe from the lows that we see in the first 90 minutes, I expect the bulls to come in with a bit of a fight. But the global queues, they ain't good. And, you know, the troika is not looking very, very good. Whether you look at the dollar index, whether you look at the yields, or uh, you look at Brent crude prices as well. So the troika, so to call it, is against us. So that's the problem pocket. What are the big queues for today? Well, you have a couple of weekly expiries that play, play out. Because tomorrow is, uh, you know, a holiday. So you'll have both the Nifty Bank as well as the Nifty Financial Services Index that will be playing out the weekly expiry today itself. So both those two on our radar. Well, what else uh, are, are we looking at? Well, it appears that in the near term, you know, there could be some a preference for larger cap names in comparison to the broader market stocks because some of those larger cap names yesterday, they were quite firm, and I'll get to that in just a bit. Now, the uh, options data comes up for you in the screen. The 22,500 call, the 22,400 call, both of them were fairly active. And because of the, you know, very aggressive writing that we saw at both these two strikes, the PCR just a few sessions ago was at around 1.3. That's come down to around 0.8. In the past, when the PCR moves down to around 0.65 to around 0.7, that's where we see a bit of a bounce. So let's see how that goes. But that's one of the indicators in there. The second indicator is a few sessions ago, I was pointing out that the FIs, well, they're going overtly net long. And you don't like a market that's devoid of shots. Now that's turning around a little bit. Yesterday, they unbound longs big time and they added some shots as well, which brings the long positioning now down to around 40, 49%. And in absolute terms, you know, the market was net short with close to around, you know, the FIs with close to 35,000 contracts on the short side. That gradually turned around. We went to a net long position of close to around 51,000 contracts. But after the big swing that we saw of close to around 40,000 contracts, we are back down to being net short with close to around 5,000 contracts. Personally, I like a net short market because that's what gives you a reason to see a bit of a bounce. In terms of levels that I'm looking at, the Nifty is at the 20 DMA. And in fact, we'll be opening up gap down. So we'll be breaching that uh, but on a closing basis, I would like to see it close closer to this level. And the Nifty Bank, 300 points away from the 20 DMA. Normally, you see a bit of a bounce when the key indices hit the 20 DMA. So that's the index that I'm looking at. And as I said, the preference could be for large cap names. And yesterday, two stocks outperformed. You had Reliance Industries. It's holding at its 20 as well as 50 DMA. And Nestle as well was a relative outperformer. So I think the preference will continue even in today's trading session for the large cap names. If you pull up a chart, you'll see that Reliance Industries is hovering around the 20 and 50 DMA. And it's not breaching that mark. So that's the one that the bulls could turn to.
All right, thanks a lot, Nigel, for that. Well, plenty of market opinion as well coming through, so let's get straight to it now. These are uh, tricky times for the market as we have geopolitical concerns, but how do you approach it? Mahesh Nandurkar of Jeffrey says that FY24 is on track to be the best year since FY08 for Nifty EPS revisions versus the average 14% downgrade over the past decade. He says premium market valuations make the EPS revisions a key factor for stock performance. He also says their analysis shows a 72% correlation between the two. They trim weight in banks and cement on the downside risks and EPS estimates. They add ONGC and 361 to their model portfolio and also replace Max Health, ICIC Pro Life and Tata Steel with Apollo Hospitals, Max Life and Hindalco. Upasana Shastra of Morgan Stanley says that they've updated the policy rate path and now expect easing uh, in their uh, forecast horizon. She says this is driven by change in the US Fed rate path and domestically strong growth, both warranting high and neutral real rates. She believes that improving productivity growth, rising investment rate and inflation tracking above the target of 4% alongside a higher terminal Fed funds rate warrant higher real rates. As such, she adds, uh, they now expect no easing in policy rates in 2024-25 with policy rate steady at 6.5%, implying real rates to average about 2%. Okay, and on the bonds, Vishal Goenka of IndiaBonds.com says no escalation news yet from the West Asia conflict was eclipsed by the blockbuster retail sales numbers in the US overnight, causing the US Treasury to continue its slide from last week. He says bond prices will remain under pressure today as the US dollar strengthens further uh, globally with oil prices remaining firm. He expects the bond deals to widen with the 10-year benchmark bond deal trading in a range of 7.16 to 7.23%. Well, let's uh, run you through the list of top 10 stocks that we're tracking for you. We're looking at Cipla, Happy Fortunes, All Cargo Terminals, you have Geo Financial Services, uh, uh, GTPL Hathaway, Transformers and Rectifiers, as well as Interglobe Aviation. All of them will be reacting to positive news. Flow. On the flip side, you have LTI, Mindtree, ONGC and Oil India will be reacting to negative news flow. Okay, Rana Gupta is with us, Senior Portfolio Manager, uh, India Equity Specialist at Manulife Investment Management. Rana, good morning, good to have you with us here. So there are two drivers, there is geopolitics and there is inflation in the US, rates basically. So geopolitics we'll get to in just a bit, but in rates, Rana, uh, so there, were, there are many who are now saying, well, uh, not many, but at least a few starting to say no cuts in 2024 by the Fed uh, because the economy is doing just fine. Uh, the question, though, is, you know, higher rates, five, five and a quarter, has not hurt equity markets at all. Uh, so the lack of lower rates, will it really hurt? Hi, good morning. You know, uh, we always tend to talk about the rates. And, you know, in our last discussion, uh, we highlighted that we started this year with some four or five or even higher rate price expectation, which is now getting to two, one, or maybe even zero. Uh, now, I think what is more important, and as we have been highlighting, that the uh, Federal Reserve's stance of pause and rate cut if they need be. That is the most important stance for us. Uh, should they change and look to high credit, and which we think is unlikely, by the way, uh, but that would be the risk. But we don't see that playing out as, as such, but that's a risk. The reason why I think the, the, the demand conditions, the economy is stronger than uh, expected because the financial conditions are not as tight as perceived. And the reason is the central bank balance sheets. You know, last interaction we spoke about a Japanese central bank raising rates, but still they are expanding their balance sheet. Fed spoke about uh, ending QT pretty soon. So the financial condition is not as tight. Therefore, rates would be a bit higher than, uh, you know, than expected at the start of the year. All right. Uh, so rates would be a bit higher. But how are you feeling about a market like India now? Uh, what is the best way to approach it given that we are you know, sit virtually sitting at all-time highs in the equity markets? Gold is surging. We have an election coming up as well. There's earnings season. How do you put all of those cues together? Sure. I think this uh, rates going to, you know, 10-year rate going towards 5%. Uh, make no mistake, these are cyclical, uh, cyclical pressures, cyclical pressure the market or even geopolitical uh, events, uh, Kurgut, close to 100, all these are near-term cyclical risks. But in this, you know, in this things, we should not lose focus of the structural uh, uh, improvements in India. And, you know, one or two things that you can mention very quickly here. I mean, despite all that is going on, I noticed that last month's India's trade deficit 
was only 15 billion dollars it used to be like 2022 uh, inflation uh, headline is down to 4.9 core to 3.3 this is despite growth at 7% plus i think these are very uh, good numbers this shows fundamentally the economy is growing by investment and productivity and the way we would approach is to buy those segments which benefit the most for example uh, the digital you know the digital entire digital platform co companies they are getting market share uh, from traditional consumer companies so that's in you know, one area which you have liked uh, the very factor that you know the productivity and the investments are happening so a lot of manufacturing and industrial companies we have continued to like on the top of that there are push towards renewable energy so that is also one segment uh, that we like all right hi rana good morning and good to see you when what about the chinese market you know i'm looking at the gdp print that's coming in there and the economic data that's come in earlier today well that's a little better than estimates at least most of those parameters that came in today and that market you know say in the last 45 days or so it's showing signs that it wants to come back keep in mind it's been a big underperformer but what's your view at current reckoning with the economic data we're getting with the measures that are taken and also at these valuations See, I think uh, Chinese markets is bouncing along the bottom, and uh, I think they staged a comeback of 10, 15 percent from the from the bottom levels. Although you know, YTD, they're not moving much. But the thing is that unless a decisive call is made by the policymakers there, either on the export or on the real estate, these markets will have some rally, 10, 15, 20 percent from the bottom. But to have a sustainable rally for the for the market, I think. The problem regarding export and real estate needs to be resolved one way or the other, and or there should be significant domestic easing. The reason why it's important is that the China model has been uh, build scale in manufacturing, export, get surplus, and invest that into domestic real estate infrastructure. Now that model is not working anymore because of you know the reasons known to us. Uh, so if that's not working, then we need a more significant domestic policy response, which has not happened as as, as such. But the valuation is cheap, and anticipation you know people are anticipating so some rally from the bottom may happen. For but for a market to give you good returns, I think something needs to change on the three parameters that we spoke about. All right, Rana, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in. I appreciate your time here. That's Manu Life Investment. Let's take a quick break. Plenty of stocks to talk about, so don't go anywhere. Our list of top 10 stocks lined up in just a moment from now. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, our research team is standing by to give you the list of top 10 stocks for the day. First up, let's go across to Ekta. She's tracking Sipla and Spark this morning. Ekta, good morning. Morning. Well, I'll start with Sipla, the nifty company. It's in focus because it will be acquiring the cosmetics and personal care business of Indian company Ivia Beauty for around 240 crores. Uh, 130 crores will be paid on closing. 110 crores is going to be contingent on achieving certain milestones. For the next three years, they have certain uh, uh, brands such as Astaberry, Ikin, Bimasani on a worldwide basis. The acquisition is going to basically help their consumer health business and uh, wellness portfolio. The company says it will complement their skincare segment and build a base in tier two, tier six cities. The turnover of these brands which they've acquired is around 55 crores. Spark is going to be in focus. Remember, it's seen three down sessions and... Um, they did hold that conference call, which was much awaited last evening post markets. They did say that they will look to, um, you know, uh, they look at their portfolio to basically prioritize their assets going for forward. They will look at possibly out licensing and partnership opportunities. They are in the process of reinstating the business development activity uh, for the molecule, which did not see the successful end for um, Parkinson's. 
but they are probably studying it for leukemia but the size is going to be much lower as of now cash balance 20 million dollars they will not look be looking at uh, raising equity as of now the company is going to be looking at their cost structure to reduce costs i did hear the call uh, any near term triggers uh, unlikely for spark they uh, do have their r and d pipeline in focus but again one will have to monitor it so i expect the stock to probably be a little subdued in today's trading session as well all right thanks a lot ekta for that well i'm watching uh, for indigo i expect the stock to be in the green today because the market share continues to rise and remember it is a market leader and now overall market share has stopped 60% 60.5% actually in the month of march now indigo has gained a bit of market share at the cost of vistara because as we know vistara is facing a lot of troubles now uh, so there's a minor increase in market share that indigo has seen um, vistara in fact has seen a dip in the market share on a monthly basis for the first time since november 2023 um uh, and it's a pity because it it was a you know a, a, it was a service which was doing extremely well picking up a lot etc but now of course it has issues the indigo stock has been doing very well too it's up almost 21% in 2024 so far sitting almost at record highs so perhaps more traction over there in fact in the month of march if you look at the overall aviation data domestic air traffic is up 6% month on month and 4% year on year uh, so little bit of a dip we've seen in aviation traffic but interglobe aviation is um where the cancellation rate has been the lowest amongst all the airlines so i'm going with green on that stock okay all right going with green then on interglobe aviation uh, the crude price spike is something that could spoil the party but otherwise data looking good for them rima joins us to tell us about lti mindtree morning rima Hi good morning so in an exchange filing late last evening LTI Mindtree has announced the exit of two senior sales executive and this adds to the list of senior exits that we've seen in the company over the past 12 to 15 months so the recent exits are Mr Pankaj Chug and Gregory Dietrich but you know i've compiled a list of the exits that we've seen in the last 6 months at least but the list actually extends way back you know for almost one one and a half year this uh, you know the, the recent underperformance in the stock price is partly on account of the revenue weakness and also the senior level exits so year to date lti mindtree is down 23% underperforming the nifty it by nearly 20% in 2024 so far back to you all right uh, reema thanks very much uh, for that so we'll watch out for these names uh, but uh, let's talk about uh, more stocks with news flow sonal is standing by with that list sonal morning good morning prashant let me start with the windfall tax revision that has come by this time around the government has increased it to 9600 rupees per ton versus 6800 rupees per ton that is on crude oil production and this is the sixth revision that we are seeing since february and the second one in april itself because of the rise in crude oil prices uh, windfall tax on diesel petrol and atf remains to be uh, nil however this crude oil price or the production tax increase is something which could hurt ongc and oil india happy forgings is the other one because it has has received an order from leading global tier 1 manufacturer of automobile drive line components uh, to the tune of 500 crore rupees and all cargo terminals gave out its update for the month of march where they've seen an increase both on a month on month basis and on a yoy basis in terms of cfs volumes so that stock should see some green okay all right thanks a lot for that uh, sonal well let's hop across to vamakshi she's here to tell us about some more stocks that are in the news morning Well, good morning, Nigel. Let me first start off with Geo Financial Services. The company has said that they will be forming a 50-50 JV with BlackRock, and this is for undertaking wealth management and brokerage business in India. So, on the back of this news flow, expect the stock to open higher today. Apart from that, also watch out for transformers and rectifiers. Gujarat Energy Transmission Corp, that is Getco, has withdrawn a stock deal with immediate effect. Now, just to give our viewers a bit of a background, the company had received the stock deal notice from Getco back in. July 9 uh, back in July 2023 uh, the uh, company that is Getco had decided to stop dealing with the company for 3 years and after uh, this withdrawal that has come from Getco uh, the company is now eligible to supply for uh, uh, transformers uh, and other products to Getco and therefore uh, orders from Getco could come uh, along its way so therefore uh, expect the stock to open higher today All right, Vamakshi, uh, very helpful there. Thanks a lot for joining in. Here's a quick recap of our top stocks: stocks with positive news flow, Sipla, Happy Forgings, All Cargo Terminals, Geo Financial Services, Transformers and Rectifiers, and Interglobe Aviation. While stocks with negative news flow, Spark, LTI, Mindtree, ONGC, and Oil India. Well, uh, my colleague Sudarshan is also joining in to talk about some brokerage notes for, to focus on for the day and what you should be looking at this morning. Sudarshan, over to you. 
Morning, Sonia. So, first one is Bharti Hexacom. Jeffries has initiated coverage with a buy rating and target is 1080 per share. It says company offers a way to invest in those parts of Bharti Airtel's business that are growing faster. And over FY24-27, Jeffries expects company to deliver 16%, 21% CAGR in revenue and EBITDA. And strong cash generation should drive deleveraging of Rs. 5,500 crore. Also, it sees net debt to EBITDA ratio reducing to 0.4 times by FY27. Next is Jefferies on IDFC First Bank. It has a buy rating and target is rupees 100 per share. It says company has noted good recognition of deposit franchise, tech platform and distribution. Earlier key apprehensions were on speed of fall in cost to income ratio, credit costs and capital needs. Now turnaround of credit cards, ramp up of new branches and platforms will be the key levers. On credit costs, Jefferies has factored in rise from 1.3% FY24 to 1.8% by FY27. And it believes rise, is re rise in return on assets to 1.5% will be key to re-rating for the stock. Last one is Excite, which continues to see upgrade or increase in target price. Now Nomura maintains buy rating and target is increased to rupees 485 per share. It says EV sales get validation from Hyundai and Kia agreement and alliance with global companies, government support and EV traction might be key for the success. It is now more optimistic of its ability to win new orders from other global companies. On the back of all these, it has raised multiple to 3x book value and that is in line with the valuation of global companies. All right, uh, Sudarshan, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, Excel, of course, doing very well yesterday in a broadly down market as well. Uh, but uh, we'll track those and more. Uh, we'll take a break. We are back with Himang Jani. We'll discuss some of these individual names with him. Stay tuned. We're back. Welcome back. Hope you're having a good morning. Well, for starters, global queues uh, are not very positive, and that explains why the gift if you're suggesting we open up gap down with a cut of front 200 points odd. But plenty of stocks to discuss. And help us out with some analysis. We're joined by Hemang Jani. Hi, Hemang. Good morning, and good to see you win. Well, let's talk about a couple of big winners yesterday. ONGC as well as Oil India, they did pretty well on the back of the spike that we saw in crude oil prices. And these geopolitical tensions as well could take out some part of the supply. But this morning, we wake up to news that there's been a, a revision in the windfall uh, tax uh, higher. And that's what could hurt them. Your view on these names? Yeah, good morning, Nigel. I think, uh, you know, in a scenario where you have this kind of uh, uncertainty uh, due to geopolitical issues, uh, people tend to hide into, you know, some of the oil and gas names, and which is what we saw, Oil India, uh, ONGC, and of course, the metal fact. I think, uh, you know, uh, given that uh, the scenario is not looking so good uh, in terms of resolution and the fact that the prices uh, may continue to remain high despite the windfall uh, in tax which has been high, I do think that there is a case for some more strength into the names like ONGC and Oil India. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, 5 to 10 percent upside as a tactical opportunity it would be a good play. but. Uh, we will have to be a little watchful because of the fact that uh, some upside has already been seen in the last couple of days. Bang, hi, good morning. I wanted your thoughts on Varun Beverages. The stock has given great returns to investors. But now this morning, it's once again on the radar after Morgan Stanley has initiated coverage. They have a price target of 1700 on the stock. Is it worth buying despite the kind of rally we've already seen? So, Sonia, good morning. I think uh, this has been one of the best performing mid-cap stocks, you know, in the last two years. And uh, I think this is one of the companies which is delivering in terms of uh, high volume growth, you know, somewhere close to about 20% with incremental triggers in terms of uh, the recent uh, acquisition in South Africa and the new product launches which they have done. So, I think from a core, uh, you know, Portfolio investment perspective, this is a great name. It's a you know a, a name which is trading at 75 next year forward me. It's not cheap, but 
but I think it's been consistently delivering. So uh, good to have it. Maybe if it corrects on a bad day, uh, it will be a great time to enter. <clears throat> no, I got that. Uh, by the way, uh, for uh, some uh, Himanga, uh, for some for metal stocks, basically actually resource companies, you know, Hindalgo, Hindustan Zinc, and uh, uh, Vedanta, etc. All of them had actually pretty sharp reversals from highs. Do you think, at least in the very near term, they're over uh, overbought? I think, Prashant, even the way the prices have spiked and the latest news of uh, you know, some countries banning the, the Russian export, I think that has led to further flare-up. So I think purely from a technical point of view, uh, Hindalto, Nalto, Vedarta are better placed, though they have kind of run up in the last few days. But I think uh, even the quarterly numbers for some of the names like Nalto, Hindalto would be quite good. So it would be good to have them as maybe a tactical kind of a you know opportunity uh, i'm not too sure from a 6 to 12 month perspective how they are going to pan out but surely i think vedanta also is uh, you know both with the base by to play you know as as that team it is looking quite interesting okay all right hemang what about interglobe aviation you know, that one has obviously been enjoying almost a monopoly in the market. It's been holding its market share with more than 60%. And investors have been bidding up the stock. The problem now is that input costs have spiked up as well. The fares are still they're surging. I'm traveling tomorrow as well, in fact, paying a big buck for tickets. How do you approach the stock? It's not cheap any longer. But, you know, if you want to play aviation, that's the only name. Your take at these prices? Yeah. Are by far the best uh, aviation, uh, you know, company that we have seen here, and, and you know, it has actually gone through different uh, crude oil cycles in the last few years, and has actually demonstrated its ability to deal with that. And given the fact that we are in for a, you know, a, a period where the traffic growth is going to be extremely strong, I think they are extremely well positioned. The stock has actually done well; it's now correcting a bit. But I think from a core portfolio, uh, you know, holding perspective, this is the best choice that we have. And given the recent developments with Vistara, you know, has cancelled many flights. And if oil remains high, then the, the smaller players will have a more difficult times. So I think Indigo would be surely a better bet to. Okay. We'll come back to you. I want uh, your thoughts on many more stocks, right? Really interesting brokerage views as well coming out today, but more on that later. Uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has called Tesla's Elon Musk a supporter of India, speaking at ANI about Musk's proposed visit to India next week. The Prime Minister said everyone is welcome to invest in the country if they provide job opportunities for the youth. Listen in. Elon Musk Modi ke prasamsak hai, wo apni jagah pe hai, mula ta wo Bharat ke prasamsak hai. Bharat bahut tezi se EV pe ja raha hai. मैन्युफैक्चरिंग करना चाहते हैं वो आना चाहे आइए इतना ही नहीं हम मैं चाहता हूं हिंदुस्तान में निवेश आना चाहिए क्योंकि भारत में वो चीजें जिसमें भले पैसा किसी का भी लगा हो पसीना मेरे देश का लगना चाहिए उसके अंदर सुगंध मेरे देश की मिट्टी की आनी चाहिए ताकि मेरे देश के नौजवानों को रोजगार मिले uh, okay, well, uh, here is the Prime Minister addressing the electoral bonds issue. Uh, he accused the opposition parties of spreading lies about the scheme and said the country has been pushed towards black money. The PM also spoke about his 2047 vision stating uh, he has big plans for the country and that his decisions are not made to scare anyone or to diminish anyone. Listen in. Electoral bond na hote, to kis vyavastha mein taakat hai ko dhoon ke nikalte hai? कि पैसा कहां से आया और कहां गया मैं ये कभी नहीं कहता हूं निर्णय में कोई कमी नहीं होती है निर्णय तो चर्चा कर सीखते हैं सुधारते हैं इसमें भी सुधार के लिए बहुत संभावना है लेकिन आज हम पूरी तरह काले धन की तरफ देश को धकेल दिया है और इसलिए मैं कहता हूं सब लोग पछताएंगे जब मैं कहता हूं कि मेरे मन में बहुत बड़े बड़े प्लान है और उसके लिए बहुत बड़े-बड़े फैसले हैं किसी को डरने की जरूरत नहीं है मेरे निर्णय किसी को डराने के लिए नहीं है किसी को दबाने के लिए भी नहीं है मेरे निर्णय देश के सर्वांगीण विकास के लिए है 
Okay, that's Prime Minister Modi. But let's move on. We have a market to trade as well. Manisha Gupta is joining in for a roundup of all the action in the commodity market, and there's been plenty over there. Crude prices continue to move higher. Manisha, hi. Good morning. What's the latest there? Oh, well, yes, the crude prices are back up again at $90 a barrel. And this is after Israel saying that they will respond to Iran's weekend missile and drone attack. And that is a developing story. Markets will keep an eye on that. Remember, Iran produces 3 million barrels per day of crude. As of now, there is no impact on supplies. But this is a sentiment play and the street will keep an eye on this. In the meanwhile, the rest of the market is clearly reacting to the China data, where the first quarter GDP numbers have clearly beat estimates at 5.3%. If you look at the China fixed investment, as well. That is the highest in 11 months. But that's exactly where the good data stops. The China March industrial production has seen uh, a, a, an expansion, but lesser than what we saw in the month of Jan and Feb. The China retail sales also is the softest in eight months. China first quarter industrial capacity utilization is lowest in three years. So it's quite a mixed data and most of the industrial data coming in on the weaker side. The property sector is still weaker, but the street is now divided with the stronger uh, GDP numbers whether or not the China would come out with more stimulus measures. The metal prices have reacted to this, and we've seen a bit of a profit taking in copper and zinc and aluminum as well. But in any case, the markets had run up too much too soon. We are still trading on the higher side of the range. From the highs, we're just down about half a percent as we trade right now. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot for that, Manisha. Well, let's uh, stay with the commodity space. And Rahul Jain, a metal analyst, joins us uh, with his call on the metal sector. Hi, Rahul. Uh, uh, good morning and good to see you, Ben. Well, what are you making of all this entire disruption that we're seeing, the sanctions that have been put on uh, Russian metal as well? It's likely to be short-lived, or do you think because, as it is, there was a bit of a supply-demand gap, that it could be more long-lasting and more positive for some of these companies? So, if you see, uh, the, a lot of the projections are quite robust for uh, especially aluminium, copper, all of these are also very, uh, you know, um, helpful in the energy transition theme, which is ongoing. And also the, uh, you know, the there there is a lot of uh, the EV. As all, all of them require a lot of, uh, you know, the uh, the base metals. So uh, and also they say typically there is a uh, there is a repricing which happens every few years. So we're kind of getting into that phase right now. And if you track the, uh, especially the large uh, base metal producers globally, the profitability isn't really very high to justify a lot of reinvestment. So uh, this kind of pricing surge, I think, will only spur kind of some kind of a reinvestment back into adding new capacities. So typically these are like five, uh, four, five, ten year kind of events which happen. And I think uh, the pricing is really indicating that uh, there is a lot of uh, demand supply mismatch which we are uh, getting into uh, as we move on and uh, which is some kind of catch up has happened so we've seen a kind of a 10% rally over the last uh, few weeks and uh, definitely indian uh, metal producers are quite profitable uh, they are uh, way up the cost curve so we can see a lot of uh, you know uh, earning growth very significant earning growth actually coming on from here uh, okay. hmm. yeah yeah right uh, rahul and just to alert our viewers that in fact rahul is now uh, independent you know and uh, obviously investing and has a call on metals as well. Rahul, uh, since you're saying that, you know, there'll be a bit of a spurt, we've already seen aluminum prices move up. But yeah. from yesterday's high as well, if I look at it, they did come off the highs. What kind of a range do you expect aluminum prices to settle at? Because that's the one that's really driving stocks like Nalco, Vidanta, Hindalco. And what would be your pick among the three? So see, uh, if for example, India, we produce about between four four and a half million tons of aluminium and in the global context we're still less i mean around five to seven percent of global production but in the terms of cost curve the indian um, uh, aluminium producer especially are uh, very profitable uh, largely because they're fully integrated they have uh, they, uh, mm -hmm. they have their own alumina production uh, they have their own coal mining also in some cases so uh, in terms of pricing see uh, obviously these are determined by mostly global factors the recent price increase was largely because of Russian metal not being allowed in, to trade in LME uh, after a particular date. So all those events are pushing prices higher and especially for India, uh, in, especially in case of Vedanta, they are uh, going to add a lot of uh, coal, mine, uh, coal mining capacities. So they are, uh, you can uh, look at them doing more than $1,000 EBITDA per ton very soon. Uh, uh, Hindalco will probably cross that level at this point because the pricing increase that we've seen. But uh, again, with Hindalco, there is a slight of a, uh, they are also, the earnings are also determined by uh, what is in, by the Novelis operation, which is not a pure play metal in that sense, more of a converter. 
in case of nalco they are actually constrained by capacity so they are not really added any smelting capacity uh, for, for at least last more than 10 years and they don't have any plans uh, they are focusing more on the alumina side of the business where they are going to add a million ton alumina capacity uh, they are, they are into two minds actually because uh, when i met them a few years uh, like a couple uh, more than 2 3 years ago so they were uh, deciding whether they want to add a smelting capacity so for example they are less than half a million ton the biggest player in aluminum is actually vedanta they are about uh, 2.3 million and they have a half million ton capacity coming what is in the pref- right mm. well, what is yeah, the preference now uh, vedanta definitely on the top of the pack because uh, there is a very big operating leverage as well as financial leverage that we can see over there and uh, in, in terms of operating leverage uh, they are adding a coal mine and also the uh, they are increasing the alumina capacity so for them uh, from the for example the last quarter the ebitda per ton was lower than 600 dollars and it has a potential to go above 1000 dollars so the ebitda per ton uh, ebitda actually uh, the swing can be quite massive so uh, and in case of with like a, in dalco like i said it's more of a converter so you can't expect earnings to uh, have a quantum jump like what we can see in vedanta and uh, 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 yeah sorry uh, hi morning i just had a follow up on nalco you were talking yeah. about the projections there but if you look at the stock right it's had a dream run in the last 6 months the stock is up over 60% yeah. uh yeah. do you see more upsides on the stock and if yes what what is the kind of target price that you're looking at so actually what how, what we've seen is, uh, in in some of the for example hindustan copper if you see they really don't have a lot of copper production but somehow i mean the stock because of there's only kind of copper play we've seen a very a uh, very disproportionate run in the stock price uh, so for example nalco uh, also probably can exhibit those characteristics because uh, their their government holding has reached to its limit you know they can't go below 50% and uh, so it's a bit of a uh, you know it can, it can look far more overpriced i would say because uh, the the business doesn't have that size to justify a, a market cap beyond the point you know so i would see maybe like another 10% but it's Uh, you know when 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 prices uh, do well uh, st- people really mm-hmm. disproportionately rate the stocks so i would think uh, in this whole space uh, vedanta has the largest room for upside because uh, they have a, a very large stake in hindustan zinc as well which is one of the world's largest uh, zinc producers they have exposure to silver so even if say they have those break up proposals but if you look at that uh, if you as a minority shareholder if i get one share of hindustan zinc that itself is worth more than 300 rupees and then you have uh, aluminum you have zinc you have so you have aluminum you have uh, the copper copper smelter is kind of short but they also have international zinc and they have uh, uh, the copper the power aspects so there are a lot of things to add up over there yeah right uh, you know rahul uh, so vedanta's clearly your top pick you used if a couple of times out there and with the group sometimes those ifs you know they come with quite a few question marks but as you said operating leverage financial leverage will play out so we got yeah. that out of the way any view on hindustan copper you know not too many analysts track it i mean you have been on the sell side as well in the past i have yeah, yeah, seen yeah. a brokerage note on hindustan copper for a while but the street is yeah. pricing in the sky it seems for the next few years your view on 350 rupees uh, So actually, how it works is that uh, copper is all over the place because see, India is a very large importer of copper. We hardly produce, I mean, very tiny amount compared to what we import. And uh, the uh, copper assets are also largely with Hindustan Copper. So there, there have not been too many copper mining auctions. So Hindustan Copper, I mean, government has invested in uh, creating new capacity, but copper is very difficult to extract from the ground, like very deep inside the earth. And uh, so obviously, you know. Uh, when you know that there is a lot of so blue sky valuation start kicking in so i mean if you bought earlier probably you can hold but uh, to get for new investors at this price there's nothing much to see on the financials you know so it's more than 100 p and things like that it's very very difficult to make a case that uh, you know you can have visible cash flows to justify this kind of uh, market cap so that is sort of a totally different uh, Uh, very difficult for uh, you know uh, to take a to be very brave and buy at this level but that's that's the way to Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. Good speaking with you and uh, getting a, a picture overall as far as the metal space is concerned. Himang is uh, uh, still with us. Himang, thanks for waiting patiently. Uh, just a uh, you know, just a few uh, <clears throat> stocks which moved pretty sharply yesterday. By the way, you know, uh, the advance decline was four is to one yesterday in favor of declines. Declines outnumbered advances four is to one. But if you track, if you add one more element, which is volumes, to what went up and what went down. it was a different picture because what went up had a lot more volume as compared to what went down where i mean you know the big volume traded names it was a short list really as as opposed to uh, what was up uh, senco uh, if you can sort of comment hemank 
had a big 16-17% move yesterday. Uh, you know, Aster DM is another one, hospital chain, largely out of the South Kerala, is a big, strong market. We had the management with us as well. They want to go to 10,000 beds. They're under 5,000 beds right now. Uh, but this is, of course, in the next five years. Just your thoughts on these two names. I think Sango uh, came out with a very strong uh, business update, uh, you know, about 24% uh, kind of a growth and uh, uh, much cheaper compared to some of the existing uh, players. So I think people do like, you know, this kind of, a, you know, franchise, which is uh, relatively attractive, delivering good growth. And I think they have carried out a very decent uh, expansion in the recent months. So I think from a uh, you know, valuation perspective uh, and delivery both. Uh, Sanko is looking uh, quite good. SRDM, I think, uh, you know, regional focused healthcare play healthcare uh, has seen a very smart bounce back post Supreme Court directive. And we think that, uh, you know, we will see a decent amount of uh, growth coming uh, from regional plays as well as the, the mm. pan India players like Max, Apollo, etc. Max is something that we've been liking. And sir, apart from the good numbers, I think the dividend payout is something that the market really liked. So I think mm. uh, both companies we have a positive view. Okay, two more stocks for you. Any of them worth buying from a longer term perspective? Let me know. Uh, Geo Financial Services, you know, there's a 50-50 JV that they've uh, signed up with BlackRock for wealth management and brokerage business in India. And Bharti Hexacom, right? Uh, Jefferies has initiated coverage with a buy. They have a target price of 1080. Any of these stocks that you like for the long term? Well, Geo Finance, we've been liking. The only thing is that the stock has run up quite a lot, more so after the PTM debacle. And uh, you see incremental news flow in terms of the foray into uh, wealth management and brokerage, etc. So I think we, we like the uh, you know the team, the the product tech that they have uh, you know built. But I think uh, it would be good to kind of wait for a bad day uh, to enter into it, given the very high valuations at which it is trading at. Uh, Bharti Exacorp, we don't cover Sunni at this point, so uh, no real view from my side. Uh, any view on uh, transformers and rectifiers, Himang? Uh, you know, the stock I'm looking at in the last one month, it's up more than 50%. It came out with a set of numbers. From there as well, it's seen a big rally. Sometimes we get a little bit sketchy on, you know, what the street is pricing. And it's a billion dollars in terms of market cap. And the news that we have is that it's got, uh, you know, Getco. They have withdrawn the stop deal with immediate effect. So now the company can supply to Getco. Any view on this name? No out numbers, uh, Nigel. I think uh, all time high, uh, top line, operating profit, net profit. More importantly, if you see the operating profit margin, uh, you know, uh, there is a 576 basis point, uh, you know, increase. The new capacity will be operational uh, by December 24, about 1 lakh. 20,000 MBA. So, looks to be a great set of numbers. The stock has run up, as you rightly said. So, uh, I would be comfortable buying these kind of companies in two parts. You know, one maybe now and, and one should have some dry powder to kind of add to any correction that we may see over the next few days. Okay, all right. Uh, let's do one thing. Let's take a quick break. We have about 10 minutes to go for the pre-opening rates to kick in. Looks like it's going to be a weak start today, but we'll take it as it comes. Uh, Mitesh Tucker, Sudarshan Sakani will be joining in on the other side for some technical trading ideas. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Uh, you're with us here on Bazaar uh, Morning Call. We've got uh, the market open, the pre-open at least, which is about, what, 12 minutes uh, out. Uh, Mitesh and uh, Sudarshan are with us with uh, what they are making of things. It's going to be a lower start again, about 200 points in the red. Uh, gentlemen, uh, good morning. Great to have both of you here. Uh, Mitesh, uh, how would you approach things? I mean, this, uh, this is going to get us, of course, we closed below the 20-day yesterday. Are we looking at a significant retracement of the recent run that we've had from the lows? Morning, Prashant. So I think that's a good possibility. Uh, one year, yesterday we had a gap down and the markets did try to bounce back, but around the infrared averages, 21, 22, 450, I think is where we got the infrared high. And uh, we had again sudden pressure with the markets closing near the base. So very clearly suggesting that the overall price, uh, action bias, and the indicator, indicators directional bias, remains on the negative side. So 
I think now there's a good chance that we will head towards 21 and 222 thousand support area, and uh, there is a chance of us breaking below that. So that's the first level. Uh, once we start getting below that, then we'll look at further continuation of the decline. But I suspect from there you might get a one to day kind of a bounce. So for the timing, we'll keep that as the target. But the overall outlook, the setup is negative, and this is now a market in the short term, which I would say uh, it's a sell on rallies kind of a. Sell on rally kind of market. Okay, got it. So Dushan Sukhani is also with us. So Dushan, would you agree that now this market, for the shorter term, has turned to a sell on rally market? And if yes, uh, what's the best way to approach it? Yeah. Good morning. See, uh, it's a sell on rally market for sell uh, for stocks only, and that is only intraday because stocks usually uh, once they start a deep correction, they follow that trend for some time. I do not think I wish to sell the Nifty or the Bank Nifty, at least especially the Nifty. The Nifty is a buy only index, and for years it has been that. But we are in a correction of some kind. I've explained that earlier. Now let this correction end. It'll, it's not as if it's going to continue forever. It will end in a day or two or a few days. Once this correction ends, we'll get telltale signs on charts that this correction is ending. We are finding stability. That's the time to go long in the Nifty. Meanwhile, just to keep yourself entertained, you can look at short selling intraday in stocks. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, Sudarshan, tell us that what are the stocks that you're tracking uh, and our viewers would like to hear that. Sure. See, Atul, again, all of the short sellings are intraday. Atul is an intraday short. It had a big down day yesterday. Keep a stop above 62.81. Birla Soft uh, is now on the verge of breaking a support level. Intraday short with a stop above 7.69. And that blue chip LNT has again broken down from a small support level, suggesting some lower levels are coming. By intraday short with a stop above 37.93. And finally, Torrent Pharma, which has been in a trading range, is now breaking down from that range. Short with a stop above 26.75. All right. Uh, Mitesh, what about you? You're sounding negative on the index, but what about your individual picks? Yeah, I've been negative for the last two, three days. I think very clearly there are signs of pullback happening. So trading on the short side would be more rewarding. I have three sell calls to buy. On the selling side is Billa Soft. As Sudarshan also highlighted that stock features on my list as well. Keep a stop at 721 and look for a target of 680. Dixon Technologies, that's a sell with a stop above 7,700 for targets below 7470. And Balrampur Cheney is a sell as well with a stop at 374 for a target of 350. And one buy call that's a conditional buy, Deep Ignited is showing good strength in the short term and medium term charts. But with the markets negative, I think I would want to you know trade it tactically. So if it starts getting past 2300, then take a buy with a stop below 2274 for the first target of 2370. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's do one thing. Let us go across now to Sneha Seth, who is a derivatives research analyst at Angel One. Sneha, hi, good morning and thanks for joining in. Um, this is a tricky market, right? It uh, seems like it's moved to a sell-on rally market. How do you approach it and what are the stocks to look at? Uh, good morning, Sonia. With yesterday's sell-off, I think the overall chart structure has been uh, a little dampened. And I feel uh, that on the uh, higher side, 22, uh, 22,400, 500 should be acting as a resistance because we have seen huge writing in the call options. On the lower side, I believe 22,000 is the support zone. Uh, con considering the overall uh, market sentiments, I believe uh, one should avoid any aggressive directional bats in index and uh, trade into individual counters. There we are seeing uh, decent uh, trading opportunities. So my first uh, call is on TBS Motors. If you see, it has broken the uh, fall, uh, rising trend line uh, support zone. And it, uh, I believe we may see further selling coming in. So I would recommend uh, selling TBS Motors with yesterday's high as a stop loss that is around 2047. And the target expected will be around 1920. Apart from this, Tech Mahindra is the uh, sell for me. Uh, 1200 put option looks good. Uh, so we can buy uh, 1200 put uh, in the range of 2022 20, and the stop list can be maintained around nine, uh, around 11 and the target can be expected around 44. Okay. All right, Sneha, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much uh, for joining us with those uh, specific ideas. We'll take a break. We are back. Uh, we have a discussion on the telecom space. Balaji Subramanian, Vice President at IFL Securities, will put the focus on Vodafone I uh, idea, the FPO, uh, which, of course, is uh, generating a fair bit of interest. Stay tuned. That's coming up. Cool. 
All right, we just have about a couple of seconds left before the pre-opening rates kick in. Hemang Jani is still with us. Hemang, uh, on Thursday, you have uh, some big numbers coming through. There is Bajaj Auto, there's Infosys, there's HDFC Life and a couple of other smaller ones as well like Mastec. Anything that uh, excites you from a long-term investor standpoint? So, Sonia, I think uh, Bajaj Auto uh, and uh, Maruti Suzuki, these are the two names where we accept, expect very strong uh, set of numbers. In case of Maruti, the growth in production should be about 20%. And Bajaj Auto also, we are looking at about 12% kind of a growth. And we think that the, the sector as a whole, you know, for this entire quarterly uh, season, auto and uh, banks and financials are going to be the two pockets where you will see a very strong growth. So we have a positive view on both these names. Okay, all right. Uh, Imang, uh, you know, stay with us. We're going to focus on Vodafone Idea. Of course, the uh, press conference, uh, and of course, we had the opportunity to ask questions to the CEO of Idea as well, Vodafone Idea. The FPO is for 18,000 crores. Uh, the company is, of course, already committed uh, to get funds from uh, the Aditya Birla Group uh, and post the FPO and how successful it is. Perhaps more funding options, bank lines, etc. will open up. Rima is here, though, with uh, the starting point, which is, of course, the uh, follow-on public offering. Rima, take it away. Thanks so much for that. So this is the largest ever FPO, 18,000 crore rupees. The price has been set at 10 to 11 rupees per share. Uh, and as you rightly pointed out, 2,075 crore has been committed by the promoters, 18,000 crore of an FPO. And after that, they are looking at tapping bank funding of about 25,000 crore rupees. So we're looking at a cash kitty of 45,000 crore rupees. Now, what's the company planning to do with all this? In the RHP, they've said that with the FPO money of 18,000 crore rupees, 70% will be used to expand 4G coverage and capacity and also begin their 5G rollout. On 5G, they said that 5G rollout should begin immediately. It takes six to nine months, but their goal is to cover 40% of their revenue base in the next two to two and a half years. We also asked them on a tariff hike because growth for the company is improving ARPUs from current levels of 145. Now, here the company says there's a two pronged approach. One is that 42% of their subscribers are still on 2G, and therefore, there is a big opportunity for the company to convert these 2G subscribers into higher value 4G subscribers. So that premiumization will enable an ARPU increase. And also compared to the rest of the peers, uh, Vodafone idea, because they've not invested so much in their capacity, the proportion of 2G subscribers is a lot more. Secondly, it will be a tariff hike. The company is not committing to when a tariff hike will take place. They have their own internal expectations. That's the word the company used. But they said we should expect a tariff hike similar to what we've seen in the past. And in the last two tariff hikes were to the tune of close to about 20%. We also asked them on the government's intention, right? Like, why now? What's changed? Um, you know, because the company has been looking to raise capital for a while now, close to about two, three years. So what's changed? Has there been any discussion from the government? Because one worry point the street has is that once that four-year moratorium ends in September of 2025, the company has huge payouts, which is lined up. And, you know, the math that the analysts have done seems to suggest it will be difficult for the company to meet those cash pay payouts starting September of 2025. So here, you know, the company is not saying anything, but they did say that the government is supportive and the reform package does allow them that if the company is unable to make uh, its liabilities that are due to the government, they can always convert those dues into equities. But, you know, I think in a nutshell, they said the government is supportive. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Uh, Reema, very helpful there, the explainer. But we're joined by Balaji Subramanian, the Vice President at IFL Securities, to tell us, uh, you know, his take on all of this. Uh, Balaji, thanks a lot for joining in. First of all, of course, is the FPO price uh, attractive for shareholders? And secondly, you know, the company has been trying to raise money for a very long time. What has changed in the environment that could perhaps make this capital raising a success? Uh, hi, good morning. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, as far as uh, what has changed in the last uh, uh, few months or so, I would believe that one is that uh, uh, the markets are also, you know, fairly bullish in general. And, uh, you know, this is probably the best time to raise the capital. So the macro part aside, uh, the next would be one is that, you know, the government conversion uh, finally happened uh, uh, early last year. And uh, after that, you know, the, uh, the stock, uh, Vodafone Idea stock uh, significantly rallied. And now, uh, you know, it's at a reasonable level where, uh, uh, you know, investors are, you know, probably uh, uh, more comfortable putting in money. And the third factor is that, uh, 
the tariff hikes are also uh, look to be uh, imminent because uh, everyone has their own considerations. Uh, of course, the uh, uh, someone like uh, Vodafone Idea, you know, it goes without saying that they need significant tariff hikes. Uh, and uh, as far as the overall industry also is concerned, you know, maybe uh, at some point in time, uh, post elections, Reliance will uh, consider taking geo platforms public. Uh, so in the run up to that, you know, uh, a tariff increase also uh, improves the return ratios of uh, all companies across the board. So, you know, I would think, you know, that is uh, uh, all these factors uh, um, are uh, uh, coinciding uh, right now. As far as the attractiveness of uh, the uh, uh, FPO price is concerned, uh, I think you know there are a number of factors here. So uh, one is that uh, it goes without saying that significant uh, tariff hikes uh, have to uh, happen uh, in the uh, uh, next uh, uh, two three years uh, because you know that is when the uh, uh, moratorium gets lifted and uh, the payouts uh, start coming for Vodafone Idea. Secondly. Uh, you also, uh, you know, uh, uh, have to keep in mind that uh, uh, the company has uh, talked about expanding their uh, 4G coverage as one of its uh, uh, key priority areas. And once that happens, the kind of subscriber churn which uh, Vodafone has been seeing uh, to its peers uh, will start coming down. So that means that the subscriber base uh, doesn't uh, uh, keep falling while the uh, ARPU can go up because of the tariff increase and also because of the uh, conversion of uh, 2G to 4G users now that uh, the company will have uh, uh, 4G coverage to uh, match its uh, uh, 2G coverage that is over uh, uh, a few quarters time. And then yeah. uh, finally, you know, one also uh, has to keep in mind uh, that the, uh, the industry that is Bharti and Vodafone has uh, filed a curative petition in the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, Malaji. Hello. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Balaji, uh, you know, just, sorry, I just wanted to come in there because you mentioned uh, about the ARPUs, you know, and they need to move up from here on. And as you said, Geo could come up with their issue, which also could support it. So, you know, where do the ARPUs need to move to? The problem for Vodafone Idea is in the second half of FI26, they'll have a lot of liabilities that will be stacked up against them. So where do the ARPUs need to move? What are you factoring in? So I would expect, you know, one the first round of tariff increases uh, should uh, happen probably uh, after election. So sometime in the second half of calendar 2024. Uh, and uh, if you look at uh, uh, this industry, typically uh, price hikes uh, happen uh, uh, every two years. So we had something in late 2019. We had something in late 2021. Uh, uh, this time, you know, maybe the uh, uh, instead of two years, it's two and a half years because uh, the elections. Um, uh, so since we are uh, we were in the run up to elections, and you know, maybe sometime in late, uh, sometime in the second half uh, or in the middle of uh, calendar year 2026, we could see another. Uh, tariff increase of 15-20%. Uh, so if these two happen and uh, the uh, 2G to 4G upgrade also happens uh, organically for Vodafone Idea, I would expect uh, the ARPU to uh, go to somewhere close to 240-250 rupees uh, from the current uh, 145 rupees for Vodafone Idea. But that said, uh, just you know, this tariff hike won't take care of the uh, cash flow requirements for the large payouts. So that is where you know the curative petition also will come into play. Uh, so if uh, the industry gets a uh, favorable verdict from the Supreme Court and uh, uh, the DOT and the telcos, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of reconcile. Uh, or at least, uh, you know, uh, the calculation errors are removed, then there could be a, a significant relief on the AGR dues. So that will result in, uh, you know, the uh, uh, payouts coming down uh, post uh, the lifting of moratorium. And finally, you know, there is also this option for the uh, government to convert uh, some of the dues uh, uh, into equity. Of course, that will depend, you know, as to uh, where uh, Vodafone Idea's cash flows are uh, in uh, uh, FI 26 and 27, and it will, it will also depend uh, on the conversion price, uh, which will depend on you know where uh, the stock is trading at that point in time. So that will determine uh, the kind of uh, uh, dilution to uh, uh, shareholders who are uh, going to come in uh, during this FPO. So frankly, there are a lot of moving parts, uh, but if yeah. everything goes well, then uh, you know uh, there can be a decent upside on the table. What kind of upside, uh, Balaji? Uh, so let's just assume a couple of things, right? Let's assume there is an extension on the moratorium. Let's assume that there is some relief on the AGR dues. 
uh, then, uh, but even then, I mean, the debt uh, is uh, what the what Vodafone idea owes the government is about two lakh crores, and the number is rising, right? So then you're looking at some kind of conversion, then you're right. uh, at, at some some price, which will uh, we don't know if that if that's the way they'll go. It'll be very difficult for the government to kind of specifically uh, forgive one company in terms of what it's owed, right? Uh, so that 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 perhaps is difficult. So conversion perhaps is what we're looking at. So assuming yes. this, what kind of upside are we looking at, Balaji? Uh, so again, you know, if all these uh, uh, things fall into place, then, you know, one is uh, looking at uh, something like uh, a fair value of close to 16, 17 rupees mm. per share. But of course, there are a lot of moving parts. And if uh, some of these things uh, don't materialize, uh, then, you know, probably uh, we won't see uh, a lot of upside on the table. So there are a lot of moving mm. parts. So if one is willing to, uh, you know, uh, believe that uh, you're all saying, Balaji, you're saying, in place, yeah, no, you're then, saying uh, extension yeah. of moratorium and some relief on AGR. Uh, you, you, the stock could get up to about 16, 17 rupees. Yeah, yeah. If both those things happen. Yeah, that is a fair value. Of course, the stock okay. can trade at you know the uh, it can trade at higher uh, uh, prices in the interim. So you know that, uh, nothing okay. prevents that from happening. <laughs> Yeah. Got it. Uh, just one final question. Do you track Bharti Hexacom? Because a lot of brokerages are now getting bullish on it, talking about how, uh, you know, it's a way to invest in uh, the stronger parts of, one of the strong parts of Bharti Airtel's business. Any thoughts there? I won't be able to comment on this. I'm sorry. Okay. All right, Balaji. We'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot yeah. for joining in. I appreciate uh, your time here on CNBC TV 18. Well, uh, let's just get back to the pre-opening rates now. Um, it has settled about 150 points lower. Uh, the Nifty is down about six tenths of a percent, so it looks like it's going to be another weak start. Sudarshan Sukhani is uh, back with us. Sudarshan, what's the call at nine ten? Well, Birla Soft is an intraday short with a stop above seven sixty nine. And Mitesh, what about you? Yeah, um, I'll go with the short on uh, Balrampur Chini with a stop at three seventy four targets of three fifty. Okay. Uh, in terms of individual stocks, Mitesh, looks like today uh, the IT stocks could be under pressure. So, Vipro, HCL Tech, Infosys, all under pressure now. And Infosys coming out with results as well on Thursday. Any thoughts on how to approach this technically? See, you know, the Nifty IT is also weak along with the other sectoral charts. But I think in terms of auto form, it's a slightly better place. So, it will fall, but it will not fall as much. Therefore, we are not looking at much of shorting opportunities over there. But still, you know, Kofor, I think, came on the list. And I was considering it, putting it as the... Uh, as, a, as a trading call for the day. I think Kofor looks one of the weakest in the lot and could possibly slide to about levels of 5200, maybe 5150 in the short. Okay, all right. Uh, Mitesh, uh, thanks very much uh, for that. Coming back to you for more. But what are the standout brokerage reports? Uh, and uh, Nimish has gone through a whole bunch of them. Nimish, uh, what's on your list? Morning. Hi, Prashant. Morning, morning. So t today's standout is on uh, GFC AMC. JP Morgan has gone ahead and upgraded the, upgraded the stock to overweight from neutral and they've sharply raised the target price to 4450 versus 3500 earlier. Now, the upgrade is because uh, AGFC AMC has been gaining market share. The market share has improved for, the, for them uh, on the back of better performance. And also, uh, you know, the, the merger benefits are still to, fo uh, still to fall through uh, as far as AGFC AMC is concerned. Uh, they expect the core EBIT margins to, uh, to, to remain steady despite the, despite the mix changing. And, and, and they believe that the regulatory overhang seems to be largely abated. So, on back of all this, they've raised the EPS estimates for FY26-27 by close to 11 odd percent, and hence an upgrade to an overweight now uh, on HDFC AMC, and they've raised the target price now to 44-50. We'll keep an eye on that one. Namesh, thanks a lot for joining in and giving us that update. HDFC AMC is the one that we're talking about. Well, let's uh, shift focus to the oil and gas space. Sonal joins us to apprise us on the windfall tax, which has been hiked. Sonal. Oh, well, yes, the oil producers will be in focus uh, on the back of that because of the continuous rise that we've been seeing in crude oil prices. The government has gone ahead. They've increased the process uh, or the taxes on crude oil production to 9,600 rupees per tonne versus 6,800 rupees per tonne. This is the sixth... Uh, increase that we have seen since February this year itself. However, the windfall tax on diesel, ATF and petrol will continue to remain nil. Uh, now, the entire oil and gas space is in focus on the back of geopolitical tensions that we've been talking about. Motila Loswal has put out a note where they see this could lead to a supply crunch and this will result in elevated oil, refining GRMs and spot LNG prices as well. Because Iran currently exports around one and a half million barrels of oil per day of crude oil, with China being the biggest customer and there could be headwinds 
headwinds for oil marketing companies and city gas distribution companies, the outlook is mixed for Gale because higher crude oil prices would mean lower refining margins for these oil marketing companies and there could be an impact of around 23-25% to 25 of these oil marketing companies' EBITDA and FY25 itself. Spot LNG prices are already higher. That could impact Gujarat Gas because it is the biggest importer of spot LNG. So the entire space will be in focus because of whatever is happening in the geopolitical space. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, Varun Beverages and VST Tiller is also on our radar today. Mangalam is here to tell us the latest on that. Mangalam, over to you. Well, for Varun Beverages, uh, you know, there has been an initiating coverage. Motira, uh, uh, we have Morgan Stanley, which has initiated coverage with an overweight rating and a target price a little over 1,700 rupees because they believe that, you know, the company which has a solid track record of domestic scaling and international opportunities will outpace the FNB industry. In fact, uh, it fits in well with their mass discretionary consumption names or theme for 2024 as well. They believe that the India revenue for the company could compound at around 19% with margins around 24%. And at current reckoning, the stock at 57 times is well placed as against peers, largely because of the higher growth opportunity that it offers. For VST Industries, and that stock is usually in focus on account of large trades, Yesterday, towards the dying minutes of trade, there was a large trade where HDFC Mutual Fund sold about 3.3 lakh shares or about 2% equity. And this is the second sale that they've done in 2024. The important part is the buyer. The buyer has been Radha Kishan Damani, who bought about 1.5% equity or 2.33 lakh shares of the shares that were on offer. And this is, again, his second purchase in this calendar year itself, where earlier he had bought about 1.4% equity itself. Radha Kishan Damani and family own about 34.34% stake in the company before this deal and now post this their stake increases to 35.85 percent the question now is with hdfc bank having nearly 6.8 percent stake in september coming down all the way to 2.5 percent where does it go from now uh, recovery in cigarette volumes as well as market share for vst industries would be crucial to watch and will family of radha kishan damani and uh, uh, you know others buy more as uh, the domestic institutional sell Okay, thanks a lot for that, uh, Mangalam. Well, one more stock on our radar is Exide. Now, the stock has been gaining ever since it's uh, tied up with Hyundai and Kia for EV batteries in India. And ever since that happened, the stock has been up, up and away. This morning, in fact, uh, Nomura has raised their target price on Exide to 485 rupees. And they say that this validation from Hyundai and Kia's MOU is very important for the company. They are more optimistic now on new orders for Exide from a lot of these MNCs or these OEMs, right? So the stock has had a dream run. Mm -hmm. And uh, Happy Forgings is the other one, a fresh order win over there. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye out on Exide. Uh, but Mitesh is still with us. Mitesh, I wanted your view on Reliance Industries because the markets are jittery. Normally, the bulls would turn their attention to one of those larger cap names and Reliance Industries was hovering around the 20 and 50 DMA. So, your view, it's starting closer to around 2,900 rupees. Um, um, I think for me, uh, most of the indicators and volatility indicators are turning flat. So, most likely a range-bound movement will continue. Uh, on the upside, 3,000, 3,020 is the level. On the downside, it's about 2850. I do believe that next couple of uh, weeks, you know, I think about 10 days kind of a period, could be spent within this range. Mitesh, CSB Bank had a move yesterday. It's almost back at its highs of 420 or so. Uh, any thoughts? Is, is there a bit of a breakout there? Possible? It's on the verge of breakout, Prashant. Yes, I think very, very possible. Uh, see, the earlier weekly high we got was around 419, which was on the 29th of December, and we're back to those levels. Yesterday, the high was around 416 uh, half. And I think the pattern is turning quite positive. So I think, let's say, once it clears this 419, 422 zone, which is the intra-week high, then I think one should definitely look at about a test of 500 rupees. So quite positive, okay. uh, just waiting for the breakout to happen before getting into it. All right. Yeah, gold prices, of course, overnight, uh, they're almost at about $2,400, right? So that's the other thing. 40% of its book is gold. Uh, you got the start, which is at about 22,120 on the Nifty. Uh, so it's a, a lower start, almost at the 61.8% retracement at the word go. Uh, and uh, there you go. 22,138 is uh, where we are at uh, right now. The Nifty Bank is down about three quarters of a percent. That's about a 350 or point cut. Mid cap index is down 0.67 percent. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we'll have the other indices come up as well. There you go. Uh, so that's a start. Advanced decline on your screen right at the top. Uh, so it's about two is to one in favor of declines. Yesterday we started with a 10 is to one decline. So our advances ratio. So this is much better. But it's a lower 150 odd point uh, down start. But Sonia has got more rates. Sonia. Well, thanks a lot for that. So it's a lower start, but down, but not out, you'd have to say.
as we kickstart trade this morning. Let's get straight to individual stocks now. ONGC and Oil India expect some negative reaction over there as windfall tax on crude has been hiked to 9,600 per tonne from 6,800 per tonne earlier. Uh, Indigo is the other one. Uh, expect some positive reaction over there as the company continues to hold their market share above 60%. And in fact, market share of Indigo has gone up after the recent troubles that we've seen at Vistara. So the stock is actually outperforming the market, as you can see on your screen. Varun Beverages, Morgan Stanley has initiated coverage with an overweight. They have a target price of 1700 which is a big upside to the current market price. And remember, this is a stock that has given huge returns to investors. So, uh, Varun Beverages holding up over there. Geo Financial Services will be forming a 50-50 JV with BlackRock for undertaking wealth management and a brokerage business in India. It's just charging ahead 3.5% higher on Geo Financial Services. Then you have Bharti Hexacom. Jefferies has initiated coverage with a buy, target price of 1080. Look at that, bucking the trend in the market up 2.5% as we speak. Uh, Jefferies writes that this is a way to invest in those parts of Bharti Airtel's business that are growing faster. So the street definitely likes what they're seeing with Bharti Hexacom. Doms is also in focus. Nuvama has initiated coverage on Doms with the target price of 1944 rupees. Big upside to the current market price. Uh, they talk about strong business potential there and Doms is up about 3.5%. Uh, then you have a couple of more stocks I'm looking at. Exide, we were talking about this earlier. Nomura has raised their target price on Exide and it's been a stock that has really, uh, you know, been uh, surging ever since it signed that MOU with Hyundai and Kia to provide EV batteries in India. So Exide is up about 1.5%. And Sipla, there's an acquisition of uh, a personal care business. So Sipla is up in the green. Last time I checked was flat with a bit of a positive bias. But all in all, you'd have to say, weak start to trade. It's the nifty bang that's really dragging its feet down almost 400 points. All right, Sonia, thanks a lot for that. Well, let's focus on a couple of more names. Happy Fortunes, the stock is up. It's up closer on 3% and otherwise wobbly market. They have won a 60 to 70 crore <coughs> per annum order from a leading global automobile manufacturer. So that explains why that stock is up 4.5%. All cargo terminals, well, the March uh, 2020 CFS volume showed a smile increase of around a percent, an 8% increase on a month-on-month -month basis as well. So that stock's opened up with a gain of closure on 3%. Transformers and rectifiers, well, uh, that stock has opened up well in the green because uh, Getco, or more commonly known as Gujarat uh, Energy Transmission Corporation, they have withdrawn the stock deal with immediate effect, which means now the company can supply uh, to Getco. So that stock continues... Uh, higher. In fact, in the last one month or so, it's up more than 75%. And the other one is Spark. It continues to reel under pressure. The stock is down close to around 5%. Uh, so that one, in fact, uh, you know, continues to trade at lower circle. And all in all, it's not too bad an opening in terms of, you know, the gift that we're suggesting a 200-point downtick. We're down close to 100 points as we speak. And the mid-cap index, guess what? That's moved into the green. The advanced decline ratio tells you the picture. More number of stocks advancing as of declining just in the initial few minutes of trade. Prashant. Uh, well, 100 points down, right? Uh, 22,160 is uh, where we find ourselves at. Uh, so that's a start. I mean, it's not uh, like yesterday. Yesterday also, it was not a uh, sort of vastly uh, down start. And then, of course, the market fell to a low, recovered. And then in the last 40, 45 minutes, there was a... Uh, sell down once again. TCS is down 1%. Uh, so on the downside, right, earnings uh, react, uh, earnings came through Friday evening. Uh, there was some hint of green and then, of course, uh, nothing. It uh, sold off. Infi is the other one which will report, but uh, one and a third of a percent lower there. Zomato is down about one and a quarter percent. It's done very well. So some pullback. Bajaj Finance is down about one and a third of a percent. Kotak Bank is down about one. So a lot of banks there are coming through. Uh, LTIM, uh, Rima was telling us about that one. Apollo Tires, RBL Bank, CoForge, Federal Bank. These are all in the one, one and a half percent vicinity in terms of cuts. So nothing very large, uh, but that's the kind of market uh, that we have. On the upside, I think we mentioned geofinance. Look at Senco. Senco is up 7% after yesterday's 18% move. <laughs> that's a 25% move, of course, just starting the day. Uh, but that's a very large move in four, into four digits now, 1,022 on Senco. And by the way, it's coming up as the second largest volume-led gainer across the board. So, I mean, that is saying something. Aegis Logistics is the other one, which is uh, Aegis Chemicals, 6%, 6.25%, 517. It's coming up as the third largest volume-led gainer. I mean, you know, uh, it doesn't usually come up at this point, at this stage, right in the word go, with these kind of volumes, but it is right now. And that's why we are mentioning it. And of course, uh, you know, RK Forgings and uh, Castrol India are some of the other 2-3% kind of movers. So more of this uh, 
in terms of specific names as we uh, go along. But let's so welcome in our market master of the day. Krishna Sangvi is a Chief Investment Officer, Equities at Mahindra Manulife Investment Management. Uh, Krishna, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, how are things, uh, what are you guys doing at the fund, uh, Krishna? If you can talk to us a little bit about what's the uh, stance like as far as the markets go. Uh, because, uh, you know, a lot of new entrants in the asset management space. Uh, and it's an interesting time to start investing because, uh, of, of course, of what the markets have done uh, on the way up. So just wanted your overall sense right now. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you're right. Uh, we're in an interesting space. <laughs> India as a country, asset management as a business has its own potential. Uh, economy grows, uh, earnings grow. Mm. Corporate earnings grow, individual incomes grow, and you know you have nice space for where we in a sweet spot shop where you know uh, nominal income for India is likely to grow much faster vis-a-vis mm. uh, -vis rest part of the world. So if you're going to have a double-digit nominal growth, uh, it's just a nice sweet spot for everything. Uh, the same set of people will consume something, they will invest in markets, and they will have you know their entire capex cycle from corporate side stroke, real estate cycle. So the environment is good. Uh, India is in a sweet spot as I was repeating maybe. Uh, what's what's possibly needs to be taken care of in this journey is evaluation. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we right now in a spot where, uh, if you really look at the next five, seven, ten years journey about you know how economy is likely to go, and even if you do a retrospect, look at last fifteen years, at various points of time, you know Indian economy uh, would have seen as tilted to one particular segment of markets, but over you know next couple of quarters or years, the things change and some other set of sector or the economy uh, picks up and that's you know in a way you can call it a relay race equivalent mm -hmm. where you know there are too many sectors each of them have a right to grow because there is so much interdependency okay. you know if 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 you want to have more car sales you know by default you need more steel and maybe someday more electricity and maybe someday more you know need for car loan so interlinkage among sectors is pretty interesting uh, so when we were a trillion dollar economy let's say somewhere in 2006 or so Vis-a-vis uh, -vis today where we are, we've seen enough phases where, you know, sometimes consumption takes over the the phase of growth. Somewhere it's capex, somewhere it's financials. Mm. So we expect something very similar to play out in next, you know, uh, five, ten years where almost the entire spectrum is going to grow. Uh, one interesting sweet spot to which we believe is uh, what markets needs to factor is, is uh, if you look at core segment of economy, and let's look at, you know, let's not forget the 10 years of reasonably low investment in the space across the spectrum, whether it is metals, whether it is, you know, electricity, whether it's refining capacity. Uh, so you had a phase somewhere in, you know, early uh, decade, which was somewhere from 2005 to 2010. A lot of capex got initiated there. Capacities came up. And, you know, like like these industries are high gestation period. Mm. So you just can't create capacity only for one year. You have to create for five years or so. So a lot of capacities were created that time. And then in the next decade, somewhere from 2010 to 12 onwards till 2022, there was reasonable, let's say, overcapacity, stroke, underinvestment uh, by corporates. And now where we are today, maybe in 23, 24, you have a situation where the way India is going to grow, you need far more steel far more power, far more refining uh, throughputs in next three, five, seven years. And and a, and a pure data point of already announced capacities tells you that we might running short of capacity somewhere in 27, 28, 29, depending on the end product. Got it. So unless the CAPEX cycle starts today. So I think one core theme is, you know, uh, economy does well. Uh, core economic sector leads the show through corporate capex or maybe you know public sector event capex. Uh, the only problem, I guess, you know, that the market is also waking up to right now is a. Of course, there are geopolitical concerns, so that could you know uh, put a break on the rally. Uh, B, a lot of the internals, right, are not looking that good. Whether crude price is moving higher, gold is moving, uh, is seeing mm. a lot of central bank buying. The US 10 year yield has moved up. Would you be a bit cautious that perhaps time has come for some sort of a correction in the market before the resumption of the uptrend? Yeah, I think uh, global uncertainty clearly creates a sentiment over time. Because mm -hmm. if, let's look at it this way Indian markets are clearly a function of how global sentiments behave. Uh, mm -hmm. Earning growth is ours, but you know the risk appetite in a way comes from how global markets uh, behave. So clearly, what's changed in last maybe a uh, couple of weeks or so on geopolitics is slightly different. Uh, mm -hmm. Those things do put some sort of a, uh, I'll put it a speed breaker as a right word rather than a break, you know. So, so to an extent, 
Uh, what can happen is, you know, that the pace of change possibly can be slightly different. But on, on a very macro piece, if you really look at and keeping gold aside for a minute, let's look at crude, let's look at uh, dollar index. Uh, they are today trading at those levels where in last 20 years we've seen those levels always. Like mm. dollar index at 106, I'm sure in last 20 years we've seen those numbers. Mm. Uh, crude at 95 or 90, we've seen those numbers in past, I mean, both up and down. I think the bigger picture is economic. Uh, economic growth, the risk appetite can be driven by those uh, global macro, we yeah. can't deny. Uh, coming from a nice base of uh, a fabulous rally of FI24, which none of us can actually you know, complain about. Yeah, it, it makes sense to, to be slightly more watchful and in markets, you know, what makes sense to be watchful of valuations rather than the markets because economy is going to grow, markets are going to replicate, the pace can vary, but I think if you keep control of valuations, I think a lot of things get evened out, you know. And volatility in our markets actually is slightly, you know, uh, at the risk of uh, exaggeration because of the intensity of, you know, leverage participants. I think uh, it's less of economic challenges. It's more of a reasonable amount of you know derivatives usage, uh, leverage participation, and as we know, leverage has its own you know challenges of uh, how you know market forces people to unwind their positions. So I think that can be a risk. Okay, all right. Hi, Krishnan. Welcome to the show, and good to see you in the studio. Well, you know, I wanted to ask you your top themes that you're looking at. You know, before we do that, I just wanted to focus on the markets for just a bit. We have recovered considerably from the low point of the day and a couple of factors are playing out here. The Nifty Bank is hovering around the 20-day MA, which is a crucial mark. We're trading a little below that mark. You'll want to see a bit of a recovery from there. So the Nifty Bank should come up for you on the screen. And Reliance Industries has recovered close to under percent from the low point of the day. So that big boy as well is fighting for the bulls. Explains why now we're down only around 85 points. The SJX Nifty was suggesting a 200-point downtick but we have seen a bit of a recovery from the low point of the day. And now the number of stocks that are advancing are in the ratio of 2 is to 1. Well, Krishna, you, you mentioned numerous times that India is in a sweet spot. Maybe in the near term, you have a couple of speed breakers. But the trend is that we're going to do well. So tell us your top two, three themes. You've already mentioned, I think, power, steel. You know, but what would be the top two themes that you would look at? And if you could, you know, just uh, elaborate a little bit. Sure. So uh, let's say the <coughs> core economy is, is a theme, you know, which we like, and that's that's uh, pretty much part of our portfolio. Is uh, uh, it's focusing more on you know capacity creation for next you know five seven years. Other part is India manufacturing, which is an interlinkage to it. Like, let's put it this way: uh, those core economy provides the infrastructure support, mm. while the manufacturing is the next story for India. Uh, you look at uh, this year, uh, we started with PLI being the world where you know. The idea is that whatever India is today produce, uh, consuming yeah. can actually be produced in India if it's imported or what the global uh, customer wants can it be made in India. Mm. So you have a nice sweet spot of India manufacturing can come in to supply exports to the world, uh, can come in to you know, so, so replace the imports. Right, so you like the EMS theme, do you like uh, the steel uh, production theme? Because as you said, there yeah. could be a bit of a shortage in the next two years or so, though we have capacities that are coming on stream, demand could catch up and then maybe be turned into a next net exporter as well. Yeah, so Precisely. Was... And that's where, you know, I, I possibly say there's a linkage of those two themes because mm. if India is going to produce something for the world or India is going to replace import of some other component which is coming from the world, mm. let's look at it this way. Those products were being produced in world by using some component called power, steel or uh, refining throughput. So, you know, in a way, from a factors of production perspective, yeah. a steel which was used in maybe Germany or, you know, power used in China, whenever those products are to be either replicated or, you know, uh, substituted in India, you will have the same sort of steel or same power or same refining throughput to be consumed. So, that's, that's a big piece, I think, which is what manufacturing and whatever is happening on, you know, on this midterm picture of creating those in-house, because these products are such that you cannot... Mm. rely on imports. Mm. You cannot say I'll import some of this and then make for the world. <clears throat> uh, but uh, there is also this renewable and uh, the, the, the source may differ, right? It may change yes. uh, over the next uh, decade or so. At least we are trying in that particular direction. So yeah. from an investment uh, thesis point of view, how do you take that into consideration? Are you going to say, well, that's, that's some time away uh, and, and uh, they, we're okay for now. I mean, focusing on yeah. traditional sources of, as you said, yeah. you know, power, etc. You know, so clearly, uh, uh, it's a transition mm. and growth combination which India is trying to manage. Mm. For a lot of other mm. countries, they are just replacing existing infrastructure with a, with a new capacity which is renewables, let's say, in power case. Mm -hmm. In India's case, we actually going to grow and parallelly replicate. So, so our sense is that 
we will still be using the existing traditional power sources called essentially thermal, let's say, for a reasonably long period of time. Even if you look at very macro picture, maybe India is the only country which actually has a 2070 as a net zero. Mm. So very fact you have a 45 year old runway of achieving net zero, there is a fair chances that we actually going to consume more mm. of those products before you reach a picking point and from where the reduction starts. Because uh, the traditional is the biggest source of, you know, levelized uh, supply option for power. And similarly for petrol, diesel kind of fuel, you know, if, if we going to grow, mm -hmm. uh, we will have to use those factors of production. So in a way, it's a replacement of somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I'll say, yes, transition is a must. Uh, right steps are happening on that front. So parallelly, every cap utility is investing into renewable as well as in thermal. So when you talk about transition, right, we have a very interesting discussion which is lined up in a while from now about Elon Musk coming to India, yeah. sort of setting up a plant and, you know, uh, signing up with the Tata Group, etc. Uh, for the semiconductor uh, plant and all of that. But I wanted your thoughts on how to approach this, right? EV adoption is a big focus area for the government. But unfortunately, things have not picked up as much as they would have liked. So from a stock market angle, how are you looking at it? You know, I think uh, clearly... Uh, EV or any such technology in the early phase is going to be more driven by narrative. Correct. Uh, the ability of these players to scale up is a function of their own ecosystem of you know vendors. Mm. Uh, uh, OEM cannot suddenly say I'll produce X quantity of uh, the end product because my ecosystem is not in place. Correct. So it, it takes time uh, and that's where we are. I think EV as a sweet spot, again, it, it's, it's something which we following the world. Hmm. Other countries possibly started slightly ahead of us, so they on a slightly higher curve of EV adoption. No, but a lot of these stocks have rallied. I mean, Tata Motors are, is at a thousand rupees now. So, yeah. uh, for someone who's perhaps not participated in this rally yet, does it still make sense to uh, you know jump onto this EV adoption theme? Uh, conceptually, yes. But again, the same thing. If we are in a net zero, hmm. uh, we have a situation where EV need not be the single biggest driving force. Existing vehicle still needs to be sold. Mm. Maybe hybrid, which is another technology uh, coming up, can be relevant. Mm. But yeah, I think if you're really investing for that medium term, long term, why not EV also? Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Krishna, final question then from my end before we let you go. We have taken on board all the positives. And as you said, you know, India is yeah. well placed. But important to put some caution as well on board, right? Yeah. So as you said, you know, crude we have seen at these levels, the dollar index we've seen at these levels. You're not looking very perturbed with regard to the global picture. What's the key risk then to this big Indian stock market rally that we've seen and the booming Indian economy? Uh, sure. So I think there are two, two clear risks. One clear risk is uh, what happens to the world. <clears throat> we are very much a part of it. Mm. Uh, we have to be cognizant that Indian markets are per perhaps you know trading at among the highest uh, valuation vis-a-vis -vis any other global market. So, yes. so valuation, and you know, we've seen over time, valuation requires positive sentiments. Yeah. Uh, higher the valuation, you know, you need more higher positive on sentiment front. So we need to be aware of so same variables called dollar index, called oil price do matter. What I really meant was that those things are a cyclical where some portfolio stance can change, some sector allocations can change. Mm. But it, it's not that, you know, they are always in a one way up and down. It's a, it's a cyclical behavior of those, you know, global uh, indicators. Mm. Uh, second worry in the Indian context is the expectations. I think expectations are so strong among investors that, uh, so one is on the... Uh, earning growth itself, expectations are high in terms of ability to do much faster. Mm -hmm. And second part is, you know, in a way the belief that because nothing much is going to go wrong, let me take a leverage route to participation. Because a lot of people think uh, if the certainty factor is, it's like, you know, how you drive on highway, right? The moment you see an open highway, you <laughs> bound to drive at 100, 120. The complacency rather. factor maker. I think, yeah, complacency over expectations uh, yeah. is what investors typically, you know, uh, should, should be careful of. Well, I think, you know, the street heard the number of times you said sweet spot for the Indian markets because the market has recovered from the lows and there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely, uh, I mean, some dips are getting yeah, It is a time frame, you know, honestly. Yeah, uh, I understand that. Yeah, I think what you said, right, apart. if you zoom out a little bit and uh, extend the time horizon, then some of these other things matter little lesser. That's I mean, it. the impact is uh, becomes. We've seen ninety dollars in two thousand eight, yeah. mm. crude, right? Mm. So it's not something new. It's just at that point of time, what changed for India? Mm. Maybe currency depreciates to adjust those impacts, mm. and some other set of sectors can overtake leadership. And those things do play out in economy, and that's why you know, like this, the concept of profit pool. 
participation? Yeah. Too many sectors, none each of, of them benefit? To, none of us want to remember 2008 <laughs> because of you. I mean, of course, that, of course, you had that $90 crude and you saw what happened with the markets yeah, as well. Yeah, but then see what happened after that. Yeah, yeah, after that, there was a big recovery. Got it. Uh, the time frame is important. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining yeah. us. Appreciate your time here on yeah. CNBC TV. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, well, for the market, it's uh, actually recovered from the lows, which is great to see for the bulls, that is, if you're a bull. The Nifty is now down just about 70-odd points and the mid-caps are actually in the green. Let's move on. With days to go for Elon Musk to visit India, sources say that Tesla and the Tata Group are set to join hands. Tesla is likely to procure semiconductors from Tata Electronics as it eyes a local sourcing for allied EV infra. Tesla is expected to announce a manufacturing facility in India during Musk's visit next week. To discuss more on this likely development in the Indian EV space, we're joined by Gagan Sidhu, who is the director at the CEEW Center for Energy Finance, and Shirish Chandran, the editor at Evo India magazine. Uh, gentlemen, morning to both of you. Uh, Shirish, uh, let me start with you. Just set the tone for us, right? I mean, Tesla entering India, what happens to the incumbent players? Is it really a threat for something like a Tata Motors? And in any case, the EV ecosystem here is taking time to sort of fully develop. So at a time like this with Tesla entering, how do the dynamics change? Well, Tesla entering is going to be great for the Indian EV market because they're going to make so much of noise in India that that will really give that whole impetus to the Indian electric car scene. And it will grow the market because the more players that come in, it's better for everybody because there is more confidence. Buyers get more confidence in electric vehicles. And also it will offer something that is not really there. So Tesla would probably, their entry level model would probably be around 25, 30 lakh rupees when they start making it here in India. Right now, okay, it might give competition to Tata Motors' high-end vehicles, Mahindra's upcoming high-end vehicles, but overall the market will grow. And also they're going to invest so much in local manufacturing and that will help everybody across the board. Hmm. So, you know, you spoke about how uh, what happens to the incumbent players, right? Tata Motors is the most formidable player so far in the system. And before I toss this to Gagan, I wanted your thoughts on that. Because we have seen a fair amount of slowdown in the passenger vehicle EV sales across the board. Uh, is it because of the lack of options? Is it because of, you know, charging infrastructure not uh, uh, sort of developing in its entirety? What do you think is causing this slowdown in the passenger vehicle EV space here in India? And with... Uh, Tesla's plans, do you think that could sort of revive the, you know, animal spirits in this space? The adopters have already bought electric vehicles. They're all happy with it. In fact, if you look at the kind of response that they've been giving, they're all happy with it. Now it is the to jump. Gagan, sorry, Shirish, we can't hear you. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. They need a kind of push from the fence and coming in will probably be that push. And Tesla yeah, I'm going to come back in, to you, uh, Shirish. I, I think there's some issue with your video. So I'll come back to you in a bit. Let me get Gagan Sidhu into this conversation as well. Uh, Gagan, your thoughts on Tesla's entry and how this would sort of change the dynamics of the EV market in India? Sure, yeah. You know, I'm just going to echo what uh, Shirish said. It, it can only be a good thing. We're really at an early stage when it comes to India's EV transition. Uh, penetration is, you know, it's 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 been growing, but it's really not at a level where it's anywhere close to what the government visions uh, that it wants to achieve by 2030, which is about a 30% penetration on average, right? So you want the EV ecosystem to grow, uh, you want new models to come in, and remember, the India's uh, EV transition so far has actually been led on the volume side, at least by two wheelers, e rickshaws, and three wheelers, right? Uh, it's the four-wheeler segment which has lagged quite a bit. Uh, some of it has got to do with the fact that uh, charging infrastructure is an issue. Uh, some of it has also got to do with the fact that perhaps there's not enough uh, model offerings. So I think Tesla coming in can certainly add to the mix in terms of, uh, of boosting the supply or the availability of the uh, of choices for consumers. Can you build on to that? I mean, EV adoption in passenger vehicles has been plateauing for the last many months, right? And the adoption is less than 2% at the moment. Uh, you spoke about two things, limited options as well as charging infrastructure issues. Let me add to that, there is a pricing premium as well, right? EV cars are yeah. at the moment about 30-40% more expensive than an average petrol car in the same category. Uh, do you think yeah. that is another hindrance and will Tesla be able to navigate all of these problems? Yes, certainly. I think, you know, pricing is certainly an issue. Um, in fact, I mean, you talk about pricing, it's also important to uh, bring up the uh, topic of policy, right? There's a host of policies, actually, that 
you know, we tend to sort of not fit together and look holistically uh, on offer to drive or catalyze the EV ecosystem in India, right? So for, for, so to start with, for example, there's a production linked, linked incentive, not just for EVs, but for advanced automobiles. Uh, there's fame, which actually sunsetted uh, at the end of the previous financial year, just last month. Uh, but you know, as a as a as a, as a demand side measure, there's there's that uh, that there's that uh, electric mobility promotion scheme which has come in as a bit of an interim measure. There's lower GST on EVs, five percent. Uh, there's state level policies on top of all this, right? So I think all of these things sort of work together in tandem to to inherently reverse the pricing disadvantage that uh, electric vehicles face vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis IC vehicles. Mm, got it. Uh, let's also touch upon what's happening globally, right? Uh, Shirish, uh, I think Shirish is back with us. A uh, couple of weeks ago, Tesla uh, announced that for Q4, their numbers were weak. A couple of days mm. ago, they decided to lay off 10% of their global workforce. This speaks a lot about how there could be a big global slowdown in the EV space. I mean, is that just a blip or do you think it's a structural slowdown? And what do you think the ramifications of this could be on the Indian market? Well, not just Tesla. Mercedes also recently walked back from their goal towards 2030 all EVs. So they said that after 2030 also, they are going to have combustion vehicles, maybe hybrid combustion vehicles. So globally, all manufacturers, not just Tesla, are seeing a slowdown in the EV space. But let's put it into perspective. Globally, EVs are at a more advanced adoption level. In India, we still have a long runway to go to get them. EVs are what, less than 2% of overall car sales in India. So we have considerable runway. And India, I think as a market, is suitable for EVs. If you have your own parking space, if you can put your own charger, you are sorted. You don't really have much issue in terms of range anxiety and where you're going to charge it and all of that. In fact, with an EV, it is more convenient. You don't have to go to a fuel station. You don't have to line up for fuel, petrol or diesel or whatever. And also driving around an EV in the city is actually much easier than driving a combustion vehicle. So here in India, if you don't look at what's going internationally, because Indian market dynamics are very different. Also, the affordability levels in India are very different. With an EV, your charging costs are almost next to nothing. It costs less to run an EV than to use a local municipality transport bus. So your running costs are very low and Indians are very value conscious. So I think there's a long way we can go and uh, there is space to grow, lots of space to grow in India. So, you know, you were earlier telling us, Shirish, about the issues that the passenger vehicle space and the EV market are facing, right? Penetration is less than 2%. And there are three main issues that we discussed with Gagan as well. Limited options in the EV market, a premium pricing. Most of these EVs are 30-40% more expensive. And then range anxiety. Do you think we've made any headway with the three of these issues? And by when do you think penetration will reach, you know, about a double digits, 10%? Okay, so let's start with cost. The more players come in, overall costs go down, okay, because volumes increase. So that's one side of thing. And that's a great thing that testing it because they do a lot of local manufacturing and that's really going to help all of us. So that's one. Range anxiety, a lot of the OEMs say that it is over-indexed. We tend to stress a little too much on range anxiety. If you have a charger, and I suppose you are commuting in Mumbai, with your home charger, you are fine. And how many times do you go, say, Mumbai to Goa to go and drive? Once a year, twice a year? That time, of course, you have to plan it out. You have to charge up completely, maybe stop at Kolhapur and then charge until you get to Goa. But the newer range EVs that are coming will have a real world range of, say, 500 kilometers. Mm. for your Mumbai Goa drives that you do maybe walk about but honestly it's not really an issue and if you talk to anybody who's been using an EV they don't really complain about range anxiety mm. okay I think you have some issue with your uh, video again so we'll try and come back to you in a bit but uh, Gagan I wanted your thoughts on it you know you spoke about how the uh, adoption EV adoption has largely been in two-wheelers and three-wheelers but even if you look at uh, two wheelers, right, currently adoption is what, at about 6% levels. How much do you think this can scale up to? And the market structure has been uh, pretty uh, pretty closed. I mean, there are six to seven uh, players, amongst which the top four players enjoy 80% of the market share. Do you think um, this space, the two wheeler EV space could open up in a big way? 
Yeah, I think you know one of the big things that's driving EV uh, adoption, the two wheeler and three wheeler segment, is that you don't really need to rely on a public charging infrastructure, right, to charge these type of vehicles. You can actually do it in the home setting. That's been a big uh, plus for it. On top of, of course, all those incentives that I mentioned earlier, right? A lot of these incentives actually work, uh, are actually driving uh, particularly the two-wheeler, three-wheeler segment. And, and you know, these, uh, this electric mobility promotion scheme, which has come in as a bit of an interim successor to FAME 2, which uh, lapsed on March 31st, actually specifically focuses on the two-wheeler and three-wheeler segment. So I think there's a big push to actually get at least this segment to electrify first, uh, and then to actually have uh, more sort of uh, more sort of manufacturing led uh, uh, type of growth that's going to come and drive the four wheeler segment. Finally, in tandem with, of course, that all uh, important charging or public charging infrastructure, without which, of course, the four wheeler segment really fi will find it very very challenging to uh, grow. Hmm. Uh, Gagan, uh, I wanted your thoughts on the auto ancillary space. Uh, which are the companies that could be big beneficiaries of Tesla coming through to the Indian markets? And do you see a large potential here for them? Yeah, so, so you know, at a, we don't really track at a company particularly level, uh, particularly in the auto ancillary space. So that's going to be something I'm, I'm going to sidestep. But uh, more, you know, broadly for the ecosystem, where we are in terms of penetration, you know, of course, the penetration level across all categories crossed 5%. And of course it varies in, 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 in terms of electric three wheelers, it's much higher in terms of electric four wheelers, it's much lower in terms of electric two wheelers, it sort of mirrors where the uh, national average across categories is. But because it's still so low, uh, it can only be a good thing to have a Tesla come in. And I think all, you know, the, the way to sort of look at it is uh, the several policies that are in play on offer in India are actually not geared towards any one particular company. It's actually to the benefit of the Indian auto sector. It's not for any company or for any country or against. It's for the benefit of the Indian auto sector. It's, all, it's for the benefit of, uh, of, of decarbonization, right? At the end of the day, um, you know, we talk about net zero. 10% of India's emissions actually come from road transportation. So if you want to diversify away from, uh, you know, emitting sources of transportation, electric really is the top way to go. Uh, and, and finally, I'll close out by saying that, um, you know, a lot of us tend to sort of forget what an important role policy has to play in both capital raising and capital deployment decisions uh, when it comes to the energy transition. We've seen it in, 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 in the renewable space where quasi-sovereign offtake, where, uh, you know, reverse auction for price discovery and, uh, and, and, and solar parks for, to sort of mitigate uh, land aggregation risk at wonders. Similarly, you know, in India, I've talked about all those different uh, schemes on offer. Uh, on the demand side, you know, you've got fame, of course, with sunsetted, but you've also got lower GST, you also got state policies. And our own research at CW showed that states with uh, EV policies actually had 2x better volume growth. States with high incentives actually had five experts of volume growth. You know? you know, I'm so glad I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, Tamil Nadu, right? It's it's known as the Detroit of India. It's aggressively pushing itself uh, to be a, a manufacturing hub for Tesla. Shirish, you want to just wrap this up for us? Which are the auto ancillaries that could be big beneficiaries, and how do you see this entire thing play out now with Tesla coming through? See, Tesla makes a lot of this stuff in-house, but look at it in terms of the knowledge that they will bring into the ancillary space. Uh, I was talking to the Tata Motors engineering head recently, and they said that globally there is a lot of advancement in terms of electric vehicle technology, but nobody comes and gives that to you on a platter. Nobody shares it with you. So in that sense, we are kind of trying to catch up to what they're doing globally, but Tesla are at the very cutting edge of EV tech. So them coming in will just add to the knowledge base here, which everybody, Tata Motors, Mahindra, all the two-wheeler space that we're talking about. And the two-wheeler space is actually the space that EVs are rapidly growing. When was the last time you heard of a combustion scooter being launched? Nobody launches combustion scooters anymore. Everybody's doing electric scooters. So they will also benefit. And that's what will benefit the mass market transition to electric vehicles. So overall, I think it's fantastic for Indian, the ecosystem. Yeah, 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 Stephen, I'm very excited to be honest. Can't wait to see the Tesla Model 3 in the Indian roads, right? Uh, 
and of course the entire ecosystem sort of growing with that. Shirish Gagan, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the show. Appreciate your time here on CNBC TV 18. Let's slip into a quick break. On the other side, our special segment, Quarter Se Quarter Tak. We have uh, earnings expectations from the FMCG sector and we'll come back with lots more. Co-presented by. Okay, 90 points lower on the Nifty. 22,190 is where we're at. Uh, the big mover today, like yesterday, is uh, Senko. Repeat performance, almost 10% on uh, some very, very strong volumes uh, today as well. So that's uh, a specific stock check. But time for our special segment, Quarter Se Quarter Tak, where we bring you earnings expectations from uh, sort of sectors, various sectors. Today, of course, it is FMCG. Mangalam is standing by to tell us what to expect. Mangalam. Well, you know, for the FMCG sector ahead of the general elections and after a long spate of demand weakness, the question on everyone's mind is naturally, ab ki bar recovery yaar. Well, while recovery is on everyone's mind, let's take a look at the fourth quarter expectations in three buckets. What's the same? What could be different? And what do we know? So what's the same? We already know that demand conditions are similar to what we've seen in the last three quarters. Operating profits for companies will grow ahead of revenue. That means there would be some margin expansion. And in uh, the consumer space itself, discretionary would do better than staples. What could be different this time around? Three things. One, management commentary on demand visibility may have a little more optimism than what it has been over the last uh, few quarters. And that's largely because there's been a gradual improvement in rural with contained inflation. But at the same time, there's also some growth headwinds emanating in urban consumption. And finally, the last few quarters have been about good margin expansion. But going forward, levers for margin expansion could also be limited as companies are passing on price hikes and reinvesting margin savings in ad spends as well. Now, what do we know already from all the updates that have come by? Godrej Consumer has reported high single-digit organic volume growth, double-digit when it comes to consolidated business. Dabur has reported mid-single-digit revenue growth. The stock declined after its update. And Marico has returned to positive growth territory after three quarters. Jewelry, that's shining. Titan on its huge base grew 19%. Kalyan Jewelers saw India business grow 38%. And Senko as well saw a 39% growth in the fourth quarter. So from the staple squad, given the recent trend and analyst expectations, companies like Godrej Consumer, Tata Consumer, Jyoti Labs and Honasa could be the likely outperformers. In, that, in the sense that it would grow higher than the industry, whereas the underperformance from names like HUL, Britannia and Dabur, as well as Imami, is likely to continue. For the paint brigade, this quarter will see high single to low double-digit volume growth. However, revenues will be lower than that because the prices are lower because of raw material deflation. But for their near future, it's all about the four Cs. Commentary on crude and competition, which is very crucial. And to wash it all down, from the beverage end of things, one expects gross margins for United breweries to improve, whereas for Varun beverages, this quarter may be impacted by winter, extended winter in the Jan to March quarter. But given the heat wave, they may do a lot better in this April to June quarter, the quarter that we're currently in. And finally, the key triggers that we're looking at, any sort of election-related demand boost, prediction of normal monsoon above normal by the Met, and stocks have seen a lot of time correction. Case in point, HUL and Dabur, they are actually at the same levels as they were pre-pandemic. So the question now again, kya ab ki bar recovery yaar? <laughs> All right, well, let's pose that question to Abnish Roy, who uh, tracks the sector very closely. Abnish, your thoughts? And, uh, you know, what are the stocks where, you, where you're still bullish on? Despite the kind of sort of volatility or pressure that we've seen in the recent quarters, where do you think there is potential for maximum growth now? Sure, thanks and uh, good morning. So definitely FY24, we are seeing investor interest uh, definitely improve uh, because of three, four reasons. One, of course, is uh, this time there will be 6% higher rainfall than normal. Last year, it was 6% lower than the rainfall. So clearly, the rural slowdown, which has been there now almost for one and a half years, we expect that from Q2, that should reverse. Uh, local player competition has been there in FMCG in a few categories. That will anniversarize in Q1. So again, from Q2, that recovery will start to happen and that will benefit HUL, Britannia, uh, Dabur, Marico, etc. Uh, third, of course, we will see that uh, definitely pricing growth was negative for most companies in FY24. We will see because of the inflation in uh, the salary cost and media inflation and crude also going up, 
we see that price hike of 2 to 3% will come back. Uh, in Q4, a uh, lot of uh, the results will be mid-tier or a bit weakish. So definitely HUL, ITC, Bajaj, etc. results will be weak. But we expect uh, United Breweries, Tata Consumer, Colgate, Goodrich Consumer and PD Light to be strong. And rest of the companies will be in between. Uh, from a stock perspective, I think where is the valuation comfort, where is FY24 likely to be Delta because of the reasons which I mentioned. I think Britannia, Dabur, Marico, uh, etc. haven't really gone anywhere as uh, Mangalam also highlighted over the last two years, even Hindustan Unilever. But I think in Unilever, there is the problem of higher royalty and the GSK sales going up, going away. So I would say that uh, Britannia, Dabur, Marico, etc. valuation comfort and the uh, uh, drivers for growth are better. Yes. Mm. Abnish, do you have coverage on Senko? So, uh, in, in jewellery, clearly the the updates are really good. Uh, we have coverage on Titan, but clearly we are seeing that the rest of the players like Kalyan and Senko are also definitely copying the template and doing quite well, growing much faster than Titan because of the smaller base. So, I will expect that uh, gold as an asset class and Organized jewellery will keep taking market share because still 70% of the industry is with uh, the unorganized players, local players. So, yes, I would expect Titan and rest of the listed players should also uh, do well in FI25 because of the gold pricing, uh, that confidence, plus definitely market share gains also continue. Okay, all right. Hi, Abnesh. Good to see you on the show. What about Nestle? Any view out there even from the FNCG pack? Nestle actually has been a relative outperformer in the last one year or so. Your view? So Nestle has done well last few quarters in terms of volume growth and pricing benefiting for them. Uh, going ahead, what we see is definitely cocoa and coffee cost as a raw material is on the higher side for them. And we will see that uh, next uh, five years, the royalty cost will go up by 15 bips every year. So currently, our pecking order in terms of good results currently and companies growing faster, uh, we will have United Breweries, Tata Consumer, Goatage Consumer and PD Light. Nestle will be lower in terms of pecking order because of the inflation risk and because of the royalty cost increasing also. Okay. Um, any other stocks that you track closely where you are expecting positive uh, you know, earnings this season? I think clearly Avenue Supermart, uh, definitely the update was clearly positive. The store expansion has sharply picked up, which we were highlighting, we were expecting. And definitely in terms of the sales growth and same store comparables, also there is an improvement. We expect improvement in the margins also. So Avenue Supermarket, clearly uh, the, the improvement will continue. Uh, same will happen for Nike also. Nike also, I think clearly the update was decent and uh, the last two quarters back to back has been good and stock has not really reacted too much to the good performance. My sense is we will see uh, rational behavior of the D2C and that's why we will see Nike growing faster than uh, uh, Honasa consumer uh, this quarter. That's our expectation. So that's also one more company in the discretionary space we should do that. Okay. Abnish, we'll leave it there for now, but uh, would love to have you back once we start getting results for uh, uh, analysis. Thank you very much for joining us uh, there. Let's talk about the uh, sort of big driver for global markets, which is geopolitical tensions. This is, of course, the flare-up in the Middle East that we've seen uh, over the weekend. Of course, we had uh, attacks from Iran over uh, uh, in Israel. Uh, and then expectations were that things will kind of settle down because uh, that's what we heard from Iran. But now, overnight, we've heard from Israel saying that they've got no option uh, but to retaliate. That's a quote. Sonal Verma is Managing Director and Chief Economist India and a Asia ex Japan and Nomura Financial Advisory uh, and Securities. And we have Mr. D.P. Srivastava, former Indian Ambassador to Iran and ex-director uh, Ed Gale uh, joining us uh, to take some questions. Uh, Mr. Srivastava, thanks very much for joining us. Sonal, good to have you with us here as well. Uh, Mr. Srivastava, I can start by asking you, sir, what's the, is there a playbook here? Uh, do you think uh, lots of moving parts? US has, US has said that they will stay out of it. Uh, expectations were that this is it, uh, you know, attack and retaliation, and that's the end of it, but uh, apparently not. Uh, we, uh, what are the chances that this escalates in a meaningful way, sir? You know, there are <clears throat> in a war situation, there are no scripts.
Let's shift focus to the commodity markets. Manisha Gupta is joining in. Manisha, what's the one commodity you're tracking today? Well, I'm looking at metals, and while we continue to talk about copper, aluminum, zinc, which are trading at multi-month highs, but there are a couple of other metals as well which seem to be doing quite well in the trade in the last few sessions there. Tin is on radar because the prices are trading at around two-year highs right now. We have seen prices gain up by 12% in last six or seven trading sessions. And for this year, it clearly has been an outperformer with 27% of gains. Now, the tin prices have been rising because there are supply disruptions seen in major producing countries, which is Indonesia, Myanmar and Congo. There are various reasons. It's electricity concerns, uh, uh, inside unrest, and Indonesia, of course, is looking at regulatory approvals. But having said that, we are looking at supply concerns, and that has been supportive. Also, when look at the LME stocks, well, they have seen a decline of 46% in this year at 4,145. And when you also take out the deliverable metals, which already have been earmarked, it's less than 4,000 tens of inventory right now on LME warehouses. There is strong demand coming in from electronics and semiconductors, and that is keeping the tin prices on the higher side. It also has to do with the longs of funds, which are holding the highest long positions level since 2018, or 18, also keeping tin prices higher. The other metal that I want to talk about is iron ore. Well, we have seen prices trade at almost 10-month lows in the beginning of April, but since then it has been a one-way rally. $106 a ton is holding right now, and we are trading at a two-week highs. The Asian activity seems to be picking up, which is supportive, and the prices have gained up by 6% in the matter of last one week itself. So when you look at the supply side of it, well, shipments from Australia and Brazil have seen a decline of 28% in last one week. Markets also are looking at the Chinese imports, which are at a record 1.8 billion in the previous year there and there is stronger demand also coming in from the china mills all of that supportive factors keeping the prices higher all right uh, manisha thanks very much uh, for that uh, so commodities in focus there uh, well let's uh, shift back to stocks uh, spark is in focus and ekta is here to tell us why ekta reema reema okay i think uh, reema is going to take that uh, reema uh, <laughs> sorry uh, go ahead well, I won't be talking about Spark, but I'll talk about LTI Mindtree, where uh, the stock has been hit because the spate of senior level you know, resignations continue. So just yesterday, the company announced in an exchange filing that two sales, senior level salespeople, the executive vice president of Global Sales, Mr. Pankaj Chuk and Gregory Dietrich, have stepped down effective 15th of April, which means immediately. And this is a long list of exits that we've seen in the last 12 to 15 months. I've just compiled in the last six months, and the high profile one there is CFO. So this has been one overhang on the stock and plus LTI Mindtree has a higher proportion of revenues or spends on dependency on high discretionary spending. So in the last one year the company's revenue growth has also slowed down. The company pushed forward its margin expectations by a couple of quarters and plus valuations for LTI Mindtree have always been higher than peers. So it's a combination of factors uh, particularly this you know senior level exits which have hot the stock year to date. Now the stock is down 25% Back to you. All right, uh, Reema, Reema, thanks very much uh, for that. Now we'll go across to Ekta, who is with us, uh, and she's going to tell us what's happening with Spark. Ekta. Well, yes, uh, the stock is under pressure today. They did hold their conference call yesterday uh, post markets, and the street seems to be disappointed because, like I mentioned, I listened into the conference call. There was nothing really very tangible to take home as a near term trigger post the conference call. So they have mentioned that they will look at their portfolio to prioritize their assets. They will look at out licensing or partnering early, uh, early, uh, earlier than anticipated in terms of other assets if required. Now they are in the process of reinstating their business development activity when it comes to the molecule which actually failed the, uh, the results when it came to Parkinson's, which is Voda Batinip. They are studying it for leukemia as well. They will possibly look for licensing opportunities when it comes to that particular molecule. But when it comes to leukemia, the market size is much lesser than what it was for Parkinson's. So Parkinson's was the real, uh, you know, was one of the real big triggers for which the molecule was being studied for. And now it hasn't really reached uh, the successful outcome. The market size, uh, like I mentioned, would be lesser. The cash balance for the company is around $20 million. They will not be looking at raising equity at this point in time. They would be looking at reducing the cost structure of the company in order to reduce costs. And hence, um, you know, there was nothing uh, in the near term or tangible to take home as an immediate trigger for Spark. Everything would be long gestation and would be lots of ifs and buts because it's an R&D program that they're undergoing. And that's probably why you're seeing the stock in the red again. Okay, Ekta, thanks a lot for that. So that is on Spark. But overall for the market as well, right? Um, just wanted to 
point out that while the headline index may be indicating red, plenty of stocks are sitting at fresh 52-week highs. So Excite, just look at that. We mentioned that earlier. 5.5% higher now on Excite. It's a fresh 52-week high ever since it signed that MOU with Hyundai and Kia to supply batteries for EVs in the Indian markets. Remember earlier, the uh, understanding was that a lot of these global OEMs will manufacture the batteries in-house. But now, after Hyundai and Kia have opened the floodgates, so to speak, of outsourcing the manufacturing of batteries to a player like Excite, this just opens the doors for a lot of opportunities that companies like Excite can have uh, with other OEMs, other global OEMs as well. And that's something that the street has been betting on. Fresh highs over there. Then you have a, something like a Vietech Vabag. We recently had that discussion with them about water desalinization, how India is going through a severe water crisis, especially in spaces like Bangalore. And uh, look at Vietech Vabag, fresh high over there at 823 rupees. So a lot of triggers actually for individual stocks. DOMS is another one, 4.5% higher. We were just talking about how you know DOMS has seen a Nomura note uh, this morning uh, on uh, initiating, uh, sorry, Nuvama note initiating coverage on DOMS with a target price of 1944. Uh, so DOMS is also another stock which is in focus. So plenty of names. Uh, by the way, I also wanted to mention that don't lose sight of the rupee. The rupee has hit a fresh record low today. I think it's at 85.60 or thereabouts. So there's been a gradual depreciation of the rupee in the last many days. And uh, this morning, the rupee is at a fresh record low, 83.50 now on the dollar rupee and that's the movement we've seen in the last one month so lots happening in the markets let's do one thing let's take a quick break on the other side we will talk about the monsoons and what you can expect from the imd dspi the head climate service division at the india meteorological department will be joining in remember the imd has predicted an above normal monsoon for 2024 which is a good thing but more details lined up in a bit Go powered by. Okay, welcome back. Uh, you know, the market's uh, coming off a little bit more. Uh, so 95 points lower on the Nifty. From being down 70, there is a leg down, uh, which has taken place in the last five, seven minutes of trade. But uh, market breadth still remains positive, uh, comfortably. Not quite three is to one, but two and a half is to one is the uh, advances dec uh, decline ratio. Uh, at this point in time. Just a few other names apart from what Sonia was talking about earlier. Dhani is, uh, should come up on your screen. 46 rupees, 12% higher. Uh, it's got humongous volumes this morning. Uh, so that's uh, on your screen right now. Uh, Capacite Infra, right? Uh, so that's 4% higher. But it's not the gain, but look, look, the volumes are very, very large on that one uh, as well. AGs, of course, have been talking about 5.5 higher, 513 that, on that name. HOEC is up about 5%, uh, that uh, stock's up at about 203, 204. Uh, and of course, uh, Tejas Networks is another one, which has got about a 5% uh, pop. Purvankara had a very large move yesterday. And actually, for the last many uh, last few days, uh, Purvankara has been moving up steadily from 250 to 380 in, what, uh, four sessions flat. Uh, so that's a very large uh, up move that uh, that one has seen. And... Uh, you know, Sharda Moore. I can go down the list, but then volumes are uh, a little lower uh, as far as uh, the markets uh, are concerned. I think we've got the uh, sort of uh, quick check as far as the rains are concerned, monsoon rains, uh, and how they are looking, uh, looking like, or how one should expect them to be. We have the India's Med Department predicting an above normal monsoon this year. They're expecting the weakening El Nino and developing La Nina conditions to be a positive factor as far as rainfall is concerned. Private weather forecaster SkyMet has also predicted a normal monsoon. Mr. DSPI, he's head of climate service division at the IMD. He's joining us now to uh, sort of explain to us what they're picking up. Mr. Pai, great to have you with us here on CNBC TV 18. Good morning. Uh, Prashant, this side, could you uh, tell us what you know so far with your forecast of uh, an above normal monsoon? Uh, you know, uh, what should we really expect as compared to the last couple of years? If you see that the uh, last couple of years, I mean, uh, since 2020, 2020, 21, 22, all these were normal or above normal rainfall. Last year, because of the strong El Nino, 
our rainfall slightly decreased less slightly less than normal which was around 94 percentage and imd had predicted 96 percentage now for this year we are expecting the strong elino year which is already started to weaken since uh, december late now currently it is in the moderate level and in the next 3 or 4 months it will turn into a neutral in so years and then uh, it is likely to turn into a weak lalina conditions so therefore uh, we are expecting this year to be above normal not only because of the lalina we are also expecting a positive iod condition in the later part of the monsoon season and uh, the winter and spring snow cover over eurasian region which is generally have an inverse relationship with indian monsoon this year it was uh, below normal and that is a uh, favorable for a normal or above normal rainfall so therefore so this you... year we are expecting a good rainfall well distributed rainfall throughout the country you said i you said you mentioned iod could what, what is uh, could you explain that sir it is the indian ocean dipole okay similar okay. to the sea surface temperature pattern in the pacific there is a pattern in the indian ocean which have got a strong influence over the indian monsoon so this year that also is a favorable for a good monsoon so you know i remember some experts global experts pointing out that when you have el nino conditions uh, sort of uh, developing it lasts for a it could last for a couple of years that's not clearly the case right mr uh, mr pai if you can explain that yeah yeah it's a some time it's a generally the period of an elino is one spring season in one year it starts and ends in the next spring season around may only occasionally it can extend to a you know 24 months or maybe slightly more just like example you are 86 87 elino okay so there are some example when you extend one or two but this year most of the models are indicating the prevailing moderate el nino will uh, weaken very fast and la nina will get developed during the monsoon season got it what about spatial uh, distribution is it too early to kind of will it be well distributed the rains across the country yeah see each year uh, the rainfall distribution will be unique but however this year forecast have a very strong signal of la nina generally we have observed during la nina yes most parts of the country get a good rainfall except eastern northeastern part where rainfall likely to be below normal so this year also model forecast are almost indicating similar pattern so therefore we are expecting la nina to be very dominant uh, you know deciding the rainfall distribution so except around orissa neighboring uh, west bengal you know south west bengal and jharkhand and the northern andhra pradesh and some parts of northeast part most other parts will have a normal to above normal range that what our forecast currently however we will update this forecast around end of may or early june got it uh, uh, that's good to hear uh, mr pai thank you very much uh, for that explanation uh, so above all, above normal monsoon and uh, that is what the imd's forecast is uh, and that's an important input for the agriculture sector uh, which largely depends on these monsoon rains um, throughout the country mr pai thank you once again for being here markets down about what 95 points 22180 is uh, where we are at uh, so it's not a big cut or anything uh, but there is some pressure which is emerging on uh, pullbacks the bank nifty is in uh, the mid cap index sorry bank pardon is in the green with about a 50 or point 60 point pop market breadth still remains Uh, very favorable. Two and a half or is to one is the advances to decline ratio. It's a wrap on this edition of Bazaar. Uh, thank you very much for staying with us. But Chartbusters will pick up on all the action in just a bit from us. Stay with us. Co-powered by.